Good day to all and thank you for joining us for day four morning plenaries, our last day for our 23rd annual International Mars Society Convention. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Executive Director of the Mars Society and from all of us here we would like to say an astronomical thank you for sticking with us. We had over 60,000 viewers watching the interview when uh, given by Dr. Zubrin and Elon Musk and likely there'll be more after this morning's, we had this excellent launch of the Falcon 9 partial reusable rocket, very exciting. And we had a great virtual banquet last night with Mars singers, inspirational art and future astronaut Alan Stern. Thank you to all and to Attendify and Zoom for your support. This has allowed us to reach further than we have ever reached before for a larger engagement and a worldwide interest in humans to Mars. Thank you to all the hardworking volunteers who are making this event happen. And don't forget, where there is a will, there is a way. You can count on the Mars Society to create the will, but we cannot do it without your help. So if you haven't already, don't forget that you can donate any amount, and we're asking for $50, but feel free to give what you can. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but we will be happy with any. Look for the dollar sign icon on our convention attendivine navigation panel. Every little bit helps, and thank you in advance. We'd also love you to become a paid member of the Mars Society. Membership gives you several benefits, including discounts in our online store and for future events, click on exhibitors and attendify to find the link to learn more about becoming a member. And that's also where you can find a link to our store or go to store.marssociety.org. Okay, let's get on to Mars day four. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Sarah Milkovich, who is a planetary geologist and systems engineer at NASA JPL, where she currently works as the lead science systems engineer on Mars 2020 rover. Sarah specializes in the science operations of robotic spacecraft, bridging the science and engineering teams. And today, she will speak with us about the Mars Perseverance rover. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Milkovich. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, here, let me... Uh start my slides. Um, hold on a sec. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, I am a member of the surface operations team for the Perseverance rover currently en route to Mars. Um, it's been a long road getting here. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about the science that we're going to do. I think this is a just a phenomenally exciting, uh, exciting mission. And um, so I'm hoping to share some of that with you today. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, Mars today is a very cold desert. Um, but from our decades of scientific exploration of Mars through um, through our telescopes and also through our orbiters and landers, um, we now believe that ancient Mars, so Mars about three and a half to four billion years ago, was very different. It had a lot of um, surface liquid water that might have, it might have been oceans and lakes sitting on the surface or under a layer of ice, but still a lot of evidence in the shapes of the rocks and the chemistry of the rocks for um, extensive water systems on ancient Mars. Part of what's so interesting about this is that from what we've learned in geology studying the Earth, we think that ancient Earth was also very different from modern Earth. And actually ancient Mars and ancient Earth were similar in their environmental conditions. Why is that so interesting? Well, let's look at what was going on on the Earth about three and a half to four billion years ago. We, uh, we had life already on the Earth. We have evidence for, for ancient life uh, starting back somewhere in that time frame. Um, and th so the, the, the fundamental idea behind a lot of current Mars research is if, if there was ancient, if ancient Earth and ancient Mars were so similar, and if life started on Earth back in that time frame, why couldn't it have started on Mars as well? And, and that's really what our rover is all about. Um, so what kinds of life are we talking about? What are we looking for? Um, our class, what you think of usually as fossils, so, you know, not even dinosaur bones, but like the imprints of leaves or 
you know, fish like classic fossils, these are all less than 650 million years old. This is very much not what we expect to see. Um, if, if life existed on Mars, it's not going to be in the form of trilobites or anything like that. We're looking, we're talking about microbial biosignatures. So these are very subtle patterns in the rocks um, that tell us that there were processes present that had to have been in, uh, that could only be in the presence of biology, in the presence of life. So we're talking about ancient microbes. This is a picture here of somebody pointing at some of these uh, microbial biosignatures. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about what those are. So there's these things called stromatolites, and this is really some of the most primitive forms of life. These are modern stromatolites in Shark Bay, Australia. Um, and what a stromatolite is, is it's basically an algal mat that is very sticky on the top and then um, dirt fall gets stuck there. They live in shallow water and dirt gets stuck on the top and another layer of algae, the algae kind of migrates up above the dirt and then there's another sticky mat and you slowly have this building up of layers of dirt that's sort of welded together by these um, microbes. So these are modern stromatolites, but we uh, have also seen ancient stromatolites. This is some of the most ancient form of, uh, of life. This is most ancient biosignature that's pretty well recognized by the, the scientific community. These are three and a half billion years old and they are in um, an area in Western Australia. And um, so this is if you took those domes from the previous slide and you sort of cut one in half, you would see this, this structure. Those are the layers of, um, of, of dirt that have been built up and welded together by these microbes. So now the thing is, is that uh, we can only find when we're talking about this is the time period that we've we've looked back as far back as three and a half billion years and we've seen evidence for life on the earth. The issue is that we don't know that much about it and we don't know uh, much about how did it get started and that's um, a major reason for that is we just don't have the rock record to look back that far. You think there's first there's the the difficulty in recognizing it but then but there's also the difficulty in just finding rocks that are that old. Um, so these yellow splotches on this map are rocks that are older than 3.6 billion years old. Uh, we have plate tectonics that recycles most of our, that's recycled most of our planetary surface. Now, the thing is that on Mars, we don't have plate tectonics. And so a huge portion of the Martian crust is very ancient. Um, so it, it might be that we have a better record of that time period on Mars in the, in the rocks than we do on the Earth. Um, so fundamentally, we think that going to Mars and looking for the evidence of ancient life in the rocks of Mars will not only tell us about Mars, but it will also tell us about the Earth and it will tell us about um, how easy or hard it is for life to start. Because right now, wherever we go, wherever we look, there is life. Um, but, but that's a planetary data set of one. And so we want to, uh, we want to go to Mars um, to, uh, to, see, to see if, that's, if that holds up. Um, how might we detect ancient, possibly non-Earth-like life? Um, the we're like I said, we're not looking for dinosaur bones or oil deposits or anything like that. Um, we're going to be looking for particular kinds of molecules, organic molecules, um, biominerals. We're looking for at the chemical structures in the rocks and the physical structures of the rocks. We're going to put all of these things together. We're, we're going to be looking for um, chemical disequilibria that uh, that you find in the presence of life. Um, we're going to be trying to put all these lines of evidence together to say, was there, could there have been, could these have been formed by life or not? 
Um, so that's uh, super ambitious and super difficult to do with a rover, but we are, that's our rover. The Perseverance rover um, is all about understanding the possibilities for life on Mars. Um, our, our major focus is on ancient microbial life, but we do also have a fourth goal, which is about preparing for the eventual uh, presence of human life on Mars. So here's our rover. Um, it is very much based off of the Curiosity design, um, although it has various uh, engineering upgrades. Uh, it has a whole new set of instruments. Some of them are the next generation version of instruments that you see on Curiosity, and some of them are brand new, uh, new design, new types of instruments that have never been flown to another planet before. Um, we are an international collaboration. Um, so we have, we're at about 400 scientists on our science team and they are from all around the world and many time zones. So that's uh, going to be an, an adventure for operating this. Well, all of us have to come together and, and work together to operate this rover and do some fabulous science. Um, Let's see. So uh, I just wanted to highlight we have subsurface radar. So as we're going to drive around, we're going to look below the surface with our, our ground penetrating radar um, to uh, look for changes in the layers of rock below us and maybe if there's any, um, any aquifers or anything like that below us. As, we, as you drive around, of course, um, you look if you're a, a geologist or even just somebody exploring you go to a new look. You need to look around at your new place. So we have MassCam Z, which is a zoomable panoramic camera. Um, we'll be taking color, zoom, stereo images. They're going to be fabulous. We have SuperCam, which is ChemCam on MSL on Curiosity, but with but it's got two lasers now. So it's super. Uh, this is going to be shooting lasers at rocks from a distance to look at the um, the the composition of the rocks. Uh, we have our weather station to know, to, to um, understand what the that sort of surface atmosphere transition area is like. And then we have at the end of our arm, we have uh, Sherlock and it's, Sherlock is a UV spectrometer um, with about 150 micron spot size and Pixel is an x-ray spectrometer, again, with about 150 micron spot size. So we're going to be making very fine scale maps of the, the composition of the rocks that we see. And of course, you can't send Sherlock anywhere without Watson. Watson is our, uh, our hand lens camera at the end of the arm. Uh, so Sherlock, Watson, and Pixel all work together. These are This is some data that the sort of lab bench version of these instruments during development took of uh, of a stromatolite. And so what you're seeing is that you're seeing that there's there's chemical differences that follow the shapes, the, the morphology of the, the patterns in the rock. So we've got, um, we're, we're, by putting together what is the elemental, the, the patterns in elemental abundances and, and what elements those are, the mineralogy and the patterns in the mineralogy plus what minerals they are, like these, um, there's some organics, uh, there's, there's types of minerals that form in a, in a water environment. Um, and so putting that all together, this, is, this tells us, this, there's a lot of signs of evidence here that what we're looking at is a stromatolite. And so this is a picture from Earth and data set from Earth. This is what we, um, it's our dream, basically. Our dream would be to be able to uh, see something like this on Mars. Um, but of course, that's, it's really difficult to, uh, we've got, you know, these ancient rocks a long way away, we're trying to investigate them with a rover. Uh, how can you be sure if they've got life, uh, evidence of ancient life or not? Uh, it's very difficult. So that's where our, th our third objective, sample caching, comes in. We are going to be drilling uh, cores of rocks. Um, they're going to be about the size of a pencil. And we place them in tubes and place them on the surface of Mars as we are exploring so that a future mission, which is you know, still in negotiation, um, uh, will come and um, fetch those samples, put them onto an ascent vehicle and launch them in orbit around Mars. And then we will have 
a, a third mission come and scoop those up and bring them back to, to Earth for analysis in our labs, because there's so much um, cutting edge research that to, to really answer the question definitively, are we seeing evidence of ancient life in these rocks? Um, we have to do the kinds of analysis that you, you have to, you can only do on Earth. You can't miniaturize it and make it robust enough to launch on a rover. Um, our fourth objective is to prepare for humans. And I believe that earlier in, uh, in this meeting, you had a presentation from the MOXIE PI, Mike Hecht, who probably told you a lot about this, but um, one of the, things of course we want to do is, is figure out, can we use Mars, the resources available on Mars to help us as we, um, we send people to Mars. People need a lot of stuff. People need more stuff than a rover does. Um, and one of the major things is oxygen. And so what we're trying to do is suck in the carbon dioxide of the Martian atmosphere and basically run it through a fuel cell in reverse and spit out oxygen. Um, the idea is that we know how this works on the Earth. We think we know how it ought to work on Mars, but let's go try it out and see how it breaks on Mars and see if we can explain how, it, how it's breaking so we can build a better one for the eventual uh, time when humans have to rely on it. We also have a technology demonstration, uh, the helicopter ingenuity. I'm not really going to talk about this, um, but it's it's going to be it's it's basically like a quadcopter uh, that uh, we're going to test out if we can fly around on Mars to to do some reconnaissance imaging. And of course, uh, we had to scramble uh, to get this whole thing finished up, being built and launched during a global pandemic. And one of the last things that got added to the rover itself was this plaque to honor the healthcare workers. Um, uh, who have been just working so hard around the world and also helped us um, be safe as we as we finished, we put the final touches on this rover. Um, so this was the last image of the rover itself. It's there um, tucked into, packed up and tucked into the back shell. Uh, and the, there's the heat shield and the crew stage. And the next time, that all of these, this was in May, and then the next time the rover will be a separate entity is um, when about six miles above Jezero Crater this February. There it is um, being uh, put into the payload fairing of our launch vehicle, um, and we got teased a lot about there's a ton of extra space there, but we needed the, the we needed everything to be wide enough to fit this uh, sort of car-sized rover in. And we launched this summer. And uh, just to, you know, consistent with how 2020 is going as a year, uh, we had an earthquake in California about 20 minutes before the launch. So um, this whole, you know, we've been, we've been on our toes for a number of reasons. Um, but we are currently happily cruising to Mars. It is today, it is 123 days until landing. We are almost halfway there and our one-way light time right now is we're at about two minutes one-way light time to the uh, the spacecraft in february february 18th we will land um, and we will be using the same landing system as curiosity the uh the sky crane um we have a few technology changes that are letting us have um a smaller landing ellipse uh, and also what we call um, terrain relative navigation where we're actually able to land in a more challenging um, place on Mars than, than we could before. So this is we're taking descent photos as we come down and comparing them to a map that we have on board that, um, from orbital images. And we will use our, uh, some of our fuel to divert away from the sharp pointy rocks. And we do this because, of course, the engineers, uh, you want to land safely. So you want to land on something flat. But geologists want to look at something interesting. And uh, interesting rocks usually are the pointy rocks. So um, once we get there, that's when this whole scientific adventure begins. We are going to Jezero Crater, which um, so here's here's the topography of Mars. Um, red is high and blue is low. 
right on the boundary of the northern lowlands and the ancient crater uh, the ancient southern highlands we have a giant impact crater the Isidus basin um, Jezero is this little crater perched on the edge one of the things that makes Jezero spectacular for us um, here's here's the crater itself uh, here's roughly our landing ellipse it's shifted a bit since then but when you look you've got this inlet valley and an outlet channel so a geologist or a geomorphologist looks at this and says okay dry riverbed uh you had to have had water flowing into this crater and it had to be there for long enough to fill up the crater and then uh flow out on the other side not only that there's this really spectacular feature here when we zoom in this has all the classic signs of being a river delta, just like the Mississippi Delta or the Nile Delta. Um, and when you're thinking about where are places to go that could have uh, hosted early forms of life and then also trapped the evidence for us of that early life for us to then go look at, river deltas are a fantastic place to go. Um, they're habitable environments. They bring in materials, uh, quickly to that can trap uh, microbes. And um, so this is this is a delta in Alaska. And the different colors sort of splotches you see there, those are different kinds of algae growing. So that is our future home. And we are already now we're doing a lot of practicing operations. And we're also thinking about what kinds of samples do we uh, think we want to take um, to represent this site uh, for future future scientists studying the samples when they finally come back. Um, and uh, not just to describe the site and have wonderful samples, but also where would where do we think we'd have uh, good luck um, recording uh, habitable environments and ancient ancient uh, signs of life. So um, uh, that's really the um, the quick run through of the science and a little bit of the engineering of the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, this is Carrie Faye. Hello. Thank you so much for presenting this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for the attendees for joining us. Um, the first question I have is um, from Matt in California, and he would like to know, how deep will the subsurface radar scan? That is really dependent on what kinds of materials we're passing over. Um, so I believe that, uh, you know, so, so radar goes further through like ice, then it goes through rock. Um, and it also depends on how many interfaces changing in, in physical properties we can see along the way. So it could be um, as it could, you know, it could be just very little, or it could be, I think, um, I think 10 feet or 10, I'm not sure if it's 10 meters or um, is how deep there is uh, on the website there's uh, information, there's a lot more sort of technical information about each of the instruments. And so um, I think that the, the RIMFAX team has put a lot more information about it there. Okay, great. The next question is from Andy. Um, and his question is, if microbial life did develop on early Mars, could it have evolved to at least slightly more complex life? We, like how, it depends on what you mean by complex. Uh, you know, life existed here on the earth for an extraordinarily long time, single celled uh, microbes, not even photosynthesizing, like not that level of, uh, of, of um, complexity. Uh, and actually when life started photosynthesizing and producing oxygen as a byproduct, uh, that poisoned our atmosphere and wiped out a huge percentage of life on Earth. Be, um, so uh, it's, it's really hard to say. I don't think we know enough. I think like if, if we're talking about like 
is it a cell with a nucleus versus a cell without a nucleus? Like maybe, but um, you know, it's, there's a, there's, uh, uh, there's a relatively short window of time that we think uh, Mars was habitable um, in a way that we recognize. Uh, and then the, the magnetic field shut down, the atmosphere uh, got stripped, uh, radiation levels on the surface increased. So it, it, um, this, the system changed and it's, if it changed slow enough for life to adapt, or if it changed so fast that that was it. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Anara, and um, her question is, when do you expect to get the samples back to Earth? That is a fantastic question that we would all love the answer to. Um, as you probably know, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, so first there's a lot of engineering challenges. There's also the financial challenges. Um, there's the, the getting the commitment right now, um, the sample return, uh, the, the phase two, the fetch rover um, and ascent vehicle um, are in the earliest stages of development. We have an agreement between NASA and ESA to work on those together. Um, so, it's it's really we we are at the the whim of uh, the space agencies and their budgets and the priorities that their that our um, our leadership has because you know there's there's so many fantastic places to explore and things to do in outer space and um, sometimes we have to take our turn uh, so I'm hoping we we joke a lot about how like there's probably some high school intern on the project who's going to be like the PI for uh, analyzing the samples themselves. Um, so we're hoping that it's soon-ish, I guess. Like, I, I know that's not a satisfactory answer, but unfortunately, that's the one I have for you. Hi, Sarah. Well, this you. is James oh. Burke. Oh, sorry, Carrie. Um, this is James Burke, Sarah. So we have a question from Robert Slater. What is the, and it's about kind of the evidence for life. What is the significance of the ratios of oxygen 16 versus oxygen 18 and also carbon 12 versus carbon 13? Oh, yes. So I had isotopes on my sort of biosignatures slide. Um, there's, depending on uh, what process, what, what metabolic process your form of life is running off of, um, the different isotopes can be uh, will be sucked up at different rates because of the slight variations in their molecular weight. Um, so, so if you see um, variations, if you see variations in these ratios that are bigger than you can explain through like a precipitation cycle or something like that, then that's evidence of um, then then that is another line of evidence that tells you that biology might have been present. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that is the um, end for questions. Um, did you have any ending comments that you would like to say? No, just uh, I hope you follow along with us. All of our images are going to be put out to the public, um, you know, shortly after they come down, once we land and continue exploring Mars. So uh, go to our websites and come on the journey with us. Fantastic, excellent talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Milkovich, for being with us. Okay, Thank we're you. gonna move on to our next speaker. Hello, okay, there I am. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Eileen Inkst, is a senior scientist with the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group and Planetary Science Institute. And she has a long list of involvement with robotic missions to Mars from Mars Pathfinder as associate, uh, PI for Mars Opportunity, conducting image analysis for Curiosity, to being the co-investigator on the sh current Sherlock Watson instrument that's right now on the Mars Perseverance rover. So she is here to share with us about Mars for the Next Decade, a report from the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group. Welcome, Dr. Yangst. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, get a thumbs up on sound. Yeah, you sound great. Great. 
And we'll do a quick screen share here, folks, if you'll just stand by for one second. There we are. All right. And just a quick, uh, does the screen look okay? Yeah, it looks perfect. Excellent, thank you. And I want to thank everybody who is online right now, uh, considering how early it must be for some of you. So thanks very much for joining me and joining us uh, as we uh, explore Mars together. I wanna give you a quick outline of what I plan to talk about. I'm gonna, uh, so the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group or MEPAG, it's another alphabet soup acronym, uh, but I'll give you an idea of who MEPAG is, what it does, why you should care. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what is going on in the Mars Exploration Program right now, how it's paving the way uh, for humans and what is coming up in the future. And I just wanna point out this really lovely picture on the right of my slide, which is a color enhanced image from the high rise camera of, a, uh, of an impact structure that was formed somewhere between February of 2017 and March of 2019, just as a, a teaser and a highlight of how uh, opportunity driven it is and how discovery driven it is to have these systematic observations of Mars. Who is MEPAG? Uh, MEPAG, again, the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group. And as someone who really hates acronyms, I'm gonna point out that I have it on my header. So when I say MEPAG, you won't have to kind of figure it out again. But we are responsible per, for providing science input that's needed to plan and prioritize the exploration activities at Mars. It's uh, basically community-based and it's interdisciplinary. We wanna get all of the, the, the best minds uh, that are interested in all aspects of Mars science and exploration together so that we can, um, as a community, explore the best ways, the most efficient ways of exploring Mars. So to do that, uh, we update our goals document and I will uh, give you more on that in just a second. Um, and we are also focused on uh, being responsive to new discoveries and new directions on the basis, <clears throat> excuse me, of the widest possible community outreach. Just to introduce ourselves, uh, this is a list of everyone who's on the steering committee. And, um, and I suppose that I should give you an opportunity to know PSI is the Planetary Science Institute. It is a distributed institution. Our, our headquarters are in Tucson, but we're all over the world. So this kind of remote um, speaking and remote working is, is kind of old hat for me. Um, uh, the goals committee, and again, I'll talk about the goals in, in a minute, uh, are at the bottom. And let me just show you the next slide, which is a picture. It's a little old. There are a couple of people who have rotated off, and we have a couple of vacancies. We're rotating people back on. But um, I wanted to, to make sure that everybody appreciated the fact that that list of names is actually a group of people who have uh, smiling faces and lives and are volunteering in this role on the steering committee uh, to forward uh, Mars exploration, essentially uh, in their free time. And so I just wanna give a shout out to them and all their hard work. What does MEPAG do? Um, MEPAG um, maintains the goals document among many other things. One of the most important things, however, we do is to maintain the goals document. And that sounds very administrative and kind of stuffy, but if you are going to do something as complex as exploring another planet, it is crucial to plan ahead, to think ahead. What are our highest priority goals in exploring Mars? Um, that allows you to let one step build upon the next step or the next step build upon the previous steps and so on. It also allows you to be discovery driven. You expect that when you take a step that you're going to learn answers to questions, but you're also going to pose new questions. And so having an overarching document 
that is um, essentially consensus by the community saying this, these are our priorities, this is where we want to go over the long term, allows us to sort of weather the uh, vagaries of differing budgets and, and um, uh, different personnel cycling in and out, uh, priorities of the nation perhaps changing, um, and so on. So the goals document is actually a, a really important uh, service that we provide to the Mars community. Um, and we just had a major revision um, that I'll, I'll talk about in just a second. We also, uh, MEPAG also stands up committees as requested by NASA and groups within NASA. Um, and that is important because MEPAG has the capability of basically finding the expertise in the community and putting together um, uh, the scientific um, brain power to address questions as they come up, um, whether they are you know, discovery driven or whether, whether there are issues that have come up, we can stand up these committees, which unfortunately often end with analysis group. And so there's NECSAG and ICESAG and anyway, you get the idea. Um, but these are, again, community volunteers who donate their expertise to help forward um, the understanding of the science, uh, the current state of the science. So why should you, as a um, perhaps a, a Mars uh, scientist, or perhaps just as a member of the public who is interested in science, why should you care about MEPAG? One of the uh, most important reasons is that MEPAG reports directly to several NASA programs, to the NASA directorates, and to the Planetary Science Advisory Committee, yet another acronym. But this PAC is uh, congressionally mandated, and it's one of the ways that Congress gets information about the, planetary the state of planetary science. So MEPAG and the other AGs, the other analysis groups, report directly to the PAC. So what you have in MEPAG is a, uh, the combined expertise, the knowledge and the resources of the Mars community. And that includes both domestic and international. So we welcome uh, uh, participation from any of our colleagues, regardless of, of where you live, what you look like. Uh, we are absolutely non-denominational as far as that goes. Uh, we, want, we want the best information that we can get and we want the best consensus that we can reach. This is uh, a slide mostly for our, our, our science listeners, but um, um, also of interest if, if any of you are particularly interested in seeing some of these documents, there are uh, links here and I'm assuming that the slides will be made available. If not, you can always go to uh, mepag.jpl.nasa.gov and that uh, website will be at the end and all of these reports are there. So we had six months uh, working on the goals document and just a recent release of that. We had a face-to-face -face meeting. We have one every year. This one was a virtual face-to-face -face meeting. That makes your head spin just a little bit. And that was in April. We talked about the decadal survey uh, the uh, National Academy's Decadal Survey, which is essentially what should planetary be doing for the next decade. And so there was a great feed in to that. And then we had a virtual meeting recently in June talking about the results of the Mars Architecture Strategy Working Group or MOSWIG. And I'll uh, give you a little bit more information about that in just a second. Just one moment, please. So recent Mars activities, what's been going on in the, uh, uh, what's the state of Mars right now? You've already heard from uh, Sarah, the really, and I mean this, I'm not being, I'm, I'm not stretching anything when I say there were heroic efforts that went into launching the Mars 2020 mission, the Perseverance rover. And this was a nearly on-time launch, which is really incredible. And when I say nearly on time, uh, we didn't launch right at the beginning of the window, and that was the only delay, which is absolutely stunning. So I want, again, to give a shout out to 
all of the engineers and the scientists and everybody who, who, who put so much effort in this time of COVID-19 um, in this, in some cases, very dangerous situations to, to launch this, this, um, this mission on time. Um, other recent activities, as I stated, the, the MOSWIG report is in its, in its final stages. What is MOSWIG? Well, basically, um, the Mars community has been focusing on its highest priority science, which is Mars sample return. And you heard some of that from Sarah just, just a few minutes ago. But what happens parallel to that? And what happens after that? Uh, we are success oriented. And so we are looking at long-term strategies. For what happens when those samples come back? What kind of science is going to be driven by what we discover? What kind of science is going to be the highest priority um, as, we, as we move forward? And so, as I said, that report is, is in its final culminating stages. And then we continue to have um, basically game-changing discoveries from the vehicles that we have right now orbiting and roving the surface of Mars. And I know uh, there have been recent talks um, in previous sessions about um, uh, the, the, the assets on the ground. Uh, I know you heard from our, our project scientist, Abby Freeman, about curiosity. Uh, I want to take just a minute and focus on some of the uh, results that we've been getting from the orbital assets around Mars. This image here you're seeing is just one example of that. Uh, this is from the Odyssey spacecraft. You can see subsurface water ice on Mars, uh, some of that at mid-latitudes, which has really profound implications for um, uh, the paleoclimate of Mars, the current climate of Mars, and uh, potentially uh, how long and where Mars was habitable. Other examples include uh, Mars reconnaissance orbiters indicating of ancient remnants of Mars northern ice caps. Uh, that was revealed by orbital sounding radar. And that allows us again to, to, to map the ancient climate. And that is a time related sort of uh, science that can only be addressed through these sort of long lived orbiters. And then uh, MAVEN, uh, MAVEN's mapping of winds in the upper atmosphere showing really for the first time that the upper and the lower atmospheres are coupled and thus revealing the global weather system in a really unique way and an important way for how we are going to address future landings. July 2020 was a banner month for Mars exploration. There were three launches to Mars. Earlier on in my slide deck, you saw the launch of uh, uh, Perseverance, but we also had the first mission from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, that's the HOPE mission. And then China's Tianwen uh, One, uh, that stands for Questions to Heaven. And this is an artist conception uh, at the lower end of the slide on the left. On the right, you'll see the ExoMars. Uh, that launch was delayed, but it is still planned. It was supposed to go this year. Uh, COVID-related delays uh, mean that that launch was pushed out, uh, but it is still planned for 2023. And we wish all luck and success to all of those missions, uh, all of our uh, international colleagues with missions who have launched and missions that uh, will soon launch. One of the things I need to give you then is an update on the Mars uh, exploration program, at least from the community side. Uh, you might hear that uh, you, you would have heard other things from people at the headquarters side, this is kind of what the community is looking at. So the good news for us is that Mars sample return is on track, as you heard uh, in part from Sarah, to bring back be these carefully chosen samples of the Martian surface um, in 2031. We're particularly excited about this because uh, although we do have samples of the Martian surface through Martian meteorites, we do not know uh, for the most part, their geologic context, and they've been altered uh, by travel through the Earth's atmosphere. And so having very carefully um, uh, kind of curated in situ, that is understanding the geologic context of where samples come from, 
and then having them return relatively pristine is uh, we think gonna be a real game changer uh, for uh, Mars science. In 2008, MEPAG, uh, the, the, the chair of MEPAG, uh, uh, Jack Mustard and the MEPAG group put out a report uh, that had 58, 58 high priority science questions for Mars and over half of them were, uh, would require sample return and most of them would be enhanced by, uh, by sample return. So to understand the early history of Earth, to study the most accessible potential off Earth abode of life, past or present, and to prepare for human exploration, all of these things can be powerfully addressed by bringing back samples from Mars. And here I have uh, what is uh, what was reported to MEPAG just a few months ago by Jim Watson, the current architecture, starting with the Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance, as you heard, caching uh, well-selected uh, important samples, moving to a sample retriever lander that would have a fetch rover, and then an Earth return orbiter to return those samples to Earth with a partnership with ESA. Um, and again, uh, we're all hoping for staying on time and bringing back those Martian samples in 2031. There is, of course, as always, some bad news. The bad news is not that we have uh, wonderful orbiters around Mars. It's that they are aging and we are concerned about um, uh, losing both the science and the technological uh, benefits that we get from those orbital missions. And you can see the heritage relay providers, that just means that not only do missions like Odyssey and uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, and MAVEN and so on, not only do these missions give us uh, some groundbreaking science as I spoke to earlier, but they also provide relays for the, uh, for the missions that are on the ground. So I am uh, one, of the, uh, one of the scientists on the Curiosity rover and we depend on uh, these orbital uh, spacecraft coming overhead so that we can upload the, the, day's, the, uh, the day's information to that spacecraft and that spacecraft can relay it to Earth. Otherwise, we are dependent upon direct to Earth communication, which doesn't happen very often. So the concern here is um, how we retain the ability to do this very systematic science that allows us to make these important long-term discoveries, as well as continue these relay assets. And the relay burden is only going to increase given the arrival of missions in the next decade. Uh, to be launched in the next de decade. And so MEPAG is really hoping for a systematic approach to supporting Mars relay requirements. And that includes, you know, the possibility of some innovative solutions like small sats or uh, commercial ventures. We have heard that one of the important things about doing these robotic missions is preparing the way for humans. And I just wanted to address that just for a few minutes. Um, Mars has drawn humans for ages, but just recently there has been a, a real drive to uh, explore Mars, to better understand Mars. And Mars remains this sort of compelling target for robotic and human exploration for many reasons. And I've just listed a couple of them here. Um, as Sarah alluded to, Mars retains almost in its entirety, a record of planetary evolution that is not found in this kind of pristine form anywhere else in the solar system. And that includes Earth. Sarah noted that the oldest rocks on Earth are not as old as the oldest rocks that we see on Mars. So we have the record of a planet that once hosted habitable surface environments similar to Earth's, but through a confluence of events that we are still trying to understand, evolved environmental conditions of less certain habitability. Um, so one thing we can do is look at Mars as the Earth that almost was. And understanding why this is so is crucial to understanding life's origins uh, by deciphering what is required for life to evolve and thrive. 
And this other reason, all environments on early Earth also existed on early Mars. That is crucial because it makes Mars the most accessible extraterrestrial planet where habitability, right, coexisted with the potential for life to arise. Our drive to explore Mars with robots yields information that will make it easier and safer for humans to go there and live there. And I've just included two ways that, that um, I think are important and ways that I feed into. One of them is environmental reconnaissance. The evolution from Mars as a telescopic object to essentially a geologic field site that you can picture yourself being at has occurred really only within about a generation, a generation and a half, with the biggest movement occurring with the mobility assets, starting with the Sojourner rover. You can see all of the mobile assets that NASA has launched um, on, these, on these images, these sort of uh, different self-portraits of, of each of these rovers. Um, why is that important? Because it tells us about the environment that humans are going to encounter. It raises the number of knowns and it raises the number of known unknowns. And that's just a fancy way of saying we learn more and we also learn what questions to ask. Because uh, oftentimes if, you, if, if you've got five little spots, say on an entire planet, that's not gonna tell you half as much, exponentially as much as being able to drive over bits and pieces of that planet because it gives you an idea of heterogeneity. How quickly do, do conditions change? How quickly um, do, do um, features change? How quickly does the composition change? It is only through mobility that we get a real idea of that on the ground. And those are gonna be important lessons for us to learn because it'll help us know what questions to ask before we risk sending people. It also gives us atmospheric data um, in that global sense that I've already talked about for EDL, entry, descent, and landing, and then short and long-term surface presence. Um, how safe is it to be on the surface? Um, because of the very, very thin pressure at the surface of Mars with the atmosphere, we're probably not going to be blown away the way we saw in the movie The Martian. However, dust is everywhere. Dust is continually blowing. How is that? Uh, causing problems for these robots on the surface. And what does that tell us about what kind of problems we will have to encounter and overcome when we send people? And that is just one short example of why it's important to have these robotic reconnaissance missions before uh, uh, to prepare the way for humans to go to Mars. I just wanna put up a summary slide uh, that kind of gives you the basic idea of what I've talked about, but I can see the questions in the question field. And so I wanna be able to, 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 to have time for questions. So I'm gonna assume that everybody online is capable of reading this last slide. I'll leave it up for just a few minutes. And you can see at the very bottom, um, go to mepag.jpl.nasa.gov to learn more about the MEPAG group. And I thank you very much and I'd be happy to take questions. Hi, Dr. Yingst. My name is Carrie Fay, and I'll be doing reading your questions for you today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. That was an incredible presentation. Um, your first question is from Christopher, and he would like to know where does crude exploration fit on the goals? We have four goals in the goal goals document. Four broad goals: um, understanding life, understanding climate, understanding geology, and then feeding into human exploration. So we have an entire goal uh, that talks about and addresses the priorities step by step for um, what we need to know before uh, we send humans to Mars. Um, so, I, I, so let me know if that answers your question. I think it does. Um, that was um, the shortness of his of his question. Um, so that's great. Um, the next question comes from Jerry Stone, and um, he asks, 
if a Mars sample return craft was in use, ISRU to make its fuel for the return, then couldn't it come back directly to Earth and not need a rendezvous to Mars orbit? As well as omitting an entire flight, it would be a proof of concept technology demonstrator opportunity. I would say that, yeah, it certainly would be a good proof of concept. It is, uh, re recall that I'm a planetary geologist and not, a, not an engineer. So I wanna be really careful about everybody understanding what my expertise is. My sense, however, is that uh, with, with the importance of Mars sample return, um, this is not necessarily the mission that we want to um, do a proof of concept study for. Uh, not something so crucial that if it fails, the mission fails. So proof of concept is typically, so for example, the Sojourner rover was sort of a, a technology demonstration, um, but the entire mission, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, driving questions of the, the Mars Pathfinder mission could be answered without the Sojourner rover. So I think the answer to your question is, could it be done? Uh, I think there's a, a, a chance that it could be, but because it would be um, uh, more of a, as you say, a, a, a proof of concept or a technology demonstration that the, crucial, the, the cruciality, is that a word? The crucial part of the mission in getting the samples back would be put at uh, what I, as a scientist, desperate for those samples would, would consider kind of an unacceptable risk. Thank you. The next question is from Graham. And he asks, the Mars Odyssey Orbiter is a major data relay satellite, which has been in Mars orbit, orbit now for over 18 years. It's critical not to lose any of the scientific data from the landers and rovers. Are there any plans to replace Mars Odyssey soon? You've hit on um, uh, a, an issue that is, that is echoed many times in the, the findings of our MEPAG meeting. So we have one annual face-to-face -face meeting every year, except for 2020. Um, and we have a number of virtual meetings every year and out of most of them come findings. And the finding that you basically uh, stated for Odyssey, but is also true for many of the other orbital assets is one that continues to show up. Uh, we at MEPAG are not aware of a, um, of a systematic uh, plan to replace or update those, uh, uh, those orbital assets. Uh, but we continue to push for uh, ways to do that so that we, we A, don't lose the relay capability and B, don't lose the science. So again, you've hit on all of the, the really important points that, that, that MEPAG has come to consensus with. Hi, Eileen, this is James. Um, question for you from Kaj. What instrument that has not yet gone to Mars would you most like to fly on a future mission? I am a geomorphologist and I would love to see a camera that is designed to take very high resolution images from very far away not just for the science, but for the ability to make operations on the surface for a rover more efficient. Now we have something on uh, Curiosity and Perseverance called the uh, RMI. And the RMI is a part of ChemCam on Curiosity and SuperCam on Perseverance. And that is, um, uh, at least on Curiosity, it's a black and white fisheye lens camera that is designed to help the, uh, the laser focus uh, on, on the correct site. But we have been using it as scientists are wont to do. Well, golly, can it do this? Can we use it for that? Can we, right? Uh, we've been using it for far distance imaging. I would like to see uh, an imager that is specifically designed to do that 
so that we can, for example, um, look a kilometer away and see millimeter or centimeter scale differences. So we don't have to travel to certain places. We can just take pictures, um, you know, specific spots and decide while we're doing something else, is that someplace where we wanna go? That would make our operations more efficient, but it would also give us some really, really high resolution images of sites that we're never going to make it to up this, up, you know, up that embankment or down that, that crater or whatever. Um, it would greatly increase our reach, our site. Um, and so if, 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 I was, if I was in charge, that's the kind of instrument that I would like to see fly next. Awesome, thank you so much. I believe that's all the time we have now. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, we'll see you on Mars. Thanks very much, we'll see you on Mars as well. Okay, Lucinda, go ahead. Okay, um, our next speaker is Bob Ballaram, and he is the NASA Chief Engineer of the exciting Mars Copter Ingenuity, now on board Perseverance that is currently on its way to Mars. He's a principal member of staff at JPL and works in the area of entry, descent, and landing, modeling and simulation, telerobotics technology, and mobility concept development. Welcome back as a speaker, Bob. We're happy to have you again. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm not... Um, that familiar with Zoom, we use a slightly different system, but I'm hoping it's all the same. Can you folks see my, my presentation screen? We can not, see your face. Yeah, yeah, not yet. Okay, share screen one more time and screen two. Let's try that. How about that? Oh, maybe I have to say share after clicking on it. There we go. Yeah, that's it's starting to work now. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay. Um, so thank you. I am going to make the assumption, perhaps not fully uh, correct, that uh, most of you have seen you know, the talk or at least know about the helicopter enough, so I don't have to cover a lot of ground as in the way of introduction. Uh, I thought I would just uh, talk more about, uh, you know, some of the things that have happened since last year. Uh, we're on our way to Mars. Uh, the helicopter is healthy. It's being, uh, its battery is getting charged every uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so we're all looking forward to that mission. And I thought I'd give you guys an update on what's been happening since approximately about last year. And also give you a little bit of direction, uh, sense of what's uh, maybe coming after uh, the Ingenuity system, you know, demonstrates uh, uh, rotorcraft flight on Mars. Uh, I'm going to attempt to show a short video clip, which is uh, basically the mission profile on Mars. Uh, it has audio. I'm hoping that that will come through. But we will see. Uh, bear with me while I get that to that. Okay, let's see. Can you guys hear that? No, we do not. Um, I think okay. to make sound work, you'll have to reshare and there's a little checkbox that says- Okay, let me do that. Computer sound. Because uh, let me see if I can do that. Uh, stop the share. Let's try share screen again. Yeah, look for a little checkbox at the bottom for sound. Shared computer sound, got it. I remember this happened to me last time. Okay. Okay, you guys back to my original screen? Yes. Okay, then let's hope that this works. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly power helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars, it's less than 
So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400, 2,600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now when it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk. And none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Okay, perfect. I hope that came through well. So that's the helicopter that's on its way to Mars. Uh, it's on its stand, uh, all done, all complete. It's uh, what we call as the flight model, the FM. Uh, just a little bit of a reminder from, uh, for, you know, why are we interested in helicopters? I see it as sort of the three R's. Um, the ability for a helicopter to reach places which, uh, you know, you can't go with landers and rovers. Uh, the tremendous range that these uh, systems can bring to bear for exploration. Uh, uh, the next generation that we are looking at actively right now will have forward velocities in the 20 to 30 meters per second. So that can cover a lot of territory in flights ranging for, for many, many minutes. And then of course, the fact that you can get up close and get high resolution images and other instruments also can operate at high resolution. So that's kind of the main motivation and this tech demonstrator, much like uh, Sojourner, we hope paves the way for a generation of aerial, aerial vehicles on Mars. Mission concepts in a nutshell, there are concepts where we have it paired with uh, a rover or a lander. One can easily imagine missions where there are more sophisticated instruments on a lander and the helicopter acts like, uh, you know, goes back, brings back samples, uh, those kinds of things back to a lander. There's also larger vehicles in the 20 to 30 kilogram class uh, carrying, you know, three, four kilograms of science payloads that uh, could be independent explorers, you know, providing sort of planet-wide access uh, uh, to all kinds of terrain. So that's kind of the, the vision for the future. So what have we built? We have built uh, Ingenuity. Uh, it's 1.21 meters from tip to tip. Uh, we came in at 1.8 kilograms. Uh, it's fully autonomous, and there are during our 30-day mission, we plan up to five flights. Um, and not going very high, not going very far, to about altitudes of about 10 meters. So that's kind of like the, the plan. So let me just give you a little bit of a sense of some of the uh, final tests that uh, we were achieving. 
So here is um, flight testing where obviously we are um, set up in our 25 foot chamber at JPL. It's about uh, 25 feet diameter and about 80 feet high. Um, and it's where we pump down the vacuum, backfill with carbon dioxide for mimic the Mars atmosphere and we test. Now, one obvious factor that we cannot include in that testing is to change the gravity. So we have this uh, gravity compensation system, which uh, basically is a very fancy constant uh, force uh, tether line, which is you know, mounted up high up in the ceiling. And this exactly compensates for the weight. Um, and the, we model the flight dynamics effects of having such a constant tether uh, gravity compensation system, and then the final flight dynamics, you know, uh, we, we validate that, that it's uh, acceptable for us, our flights on Mars. So that's kind of a, a gravity compensation system that uh, got used. A um, lot of interesting not related safety, not related technology in there, you'd be surprised to make sure that it doesn't, uh, you know, literally the whole program is hanging by a string there when we fly that. Uh, another bit of testing that we did is, uh, uh, we have a solar panel on the top that is used to harvest the sun's energy. So one of the nice things about the uh, JPL 25 foot uh, chamber is that it has the ability to simulate uh, solar illumination all the way from Venusian orbits to you know definitely to Mars. There are all these uh, high power uh, lights in the basement which uh, shine up on, through a window into a mirror and then the mirror collimates the light down onto the bottom. And there's our uh, flight unit with the solar panel uh, being tested uh, under solar illumination conditions, uh, because that's how we'll be getting our energy on Mars. The other big uh, test program that happened was to actually fully integrate with the rover and then deploy. So here, the chamber is under cold conditions. Uh, and this, this was a week-long test campaign that the rover folks did, and we were part of it. And towards the end, we went through a full deployment sequence from the bottom of the uh, rover at temperature under Mars conditions, and that was very successful. And so we have every confidence that uh, after the rover team finds a location for us on Mars, uh, probably about um, 60 sols, the 60 Martian days after uh, uh, the land, uh, we will be deposited onto the surface. And then as the video showed, they drive away to a safe distance of about 100 meters and they'll watch our first flight. Uh, so that's a deployment testing that we went through. Some other uh, nice photographs for on the road to launch. Uh, here is the, the flight unit being delivered to the spacecraft assembly facility. Uh, and uh, everybody's there in clean suits, uh, maintaining uh, both planetary protection and contamination control cleanliness. Uh, uh, as, so we, they took delivery of the system and then they are installing it onto the belly pan of the rover. So this is actually the belly of the rover and the helicopter is being assembled onto the belly and the, the rover is turned upside down to expose its belly. And then this panel with the helicopter is you know, attached onto the rover. And that's what's happening out here. You can see that the, uh, you can see the, uh, the legs, uh, all of the, the blades, the belly, and this is the rover upside down and technicians are, you know, engineers are assembling it on. Uh, that's a nice picture of after the rover is being turned right side up again, uh, you can see where we are. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, you can see the solar panel. You can see the blades going out from tip to tip. And then this is, we fly to Mars in a sideways position with uh, effectively a debris shield surrounding us. It looks like a big guitar case. It's not shown in these photographs. And the reason we have a debris shield is that during the powered flight landing of, uh, of the rover with the sky crane, there's a fair amount of rock, debris, and pebbles and things that are kicked up from the surface, and that protects us. So we are installed here with uh, the sort of a debris shield that's put on top of this. Then after we land, you know, this whole system in the deployment process goes 
makes us vertical, and then we get deposited onto the surface. Uh, then we had the actual launch, a successful launch, um, and uh, we were very happy to, to when we attempted to wake the helicopter up a few days after launch, uh, it responded. And since then, uh, we have a very slow battery uh, leakage from the avionics that's on, that's alive on the helicopter. It's in a very low power, sort of a hibernation mode right now. But nevertheless, uh, every two weeks, uh, we um, uh, give it a little bit of a battery charge activity. And we have done, I believe, uh, six of those uh, charge activities so far. We're almost at the halfway point to Mars. And uh, we've got a few more uh, months to go. February 18th is the landing date. And it'll continue to be charged by the rover till deployment. And then once the rover clears our solar panel and we see the sun, you know, we begin to charge ourselves. Uh, it's going to be a busy month at Mars. Um, there is, uh, this is sort of the notional, you know, you could imagine this is perhaps being flight five, where we take off and go very far. Uh, maybe even try to see whether we post-process images that we take from the helicopter to detect a separate landing site. Our normal landing site is something that, again, in the interest of being a, a tech demo, it's a very carefully surveyed um, site surveyed by the rover cameras. We make sure that it's acceptable in terms of being flat, uh, not too many rocks, uh, basically to guarantee you know the least possible risk uh, to the helicopter. And that's where we'll be taking and landing off on almost all our flights. But uh, towards the end, we might get a bit sporty and see whether we want to go and land somewhere else. So while all of this has been happening, uh, we have also been looking at more advanced designs. Um, the, the thinking is that uh, there is a whole class of science missions that would be possible given the unique uh, mobility capabilities of a helicopter. And so there is a sort of two classes of designs that we are looking at. Uh, we are looking at essentially stretch versions of this 1.8 kilogram system that would go into the 20 kilogram to 30 kilogram class. And we are looking at both the coaxial design, which is the one that we ended up with for Ingenuity, primarily because of space constraints uh, more than anything else. But since we would have had fully validated models uh, on designing such systems, we are also considering a hexacopter type of system uh, both these systems have uh, significant payload capabilities. Uh, they have ranges easily in the kilometer class, and they have simultaneously the ability to hover and do standoff signs. And this uh, hover time and the uh, range can be traded off, so depending on the particular mission profile. The other sort of very high heritage version of Ingenuity, which we're working on, is what we're calling as the advanced tech demo design. And that's basically we had taken a lot of very conservative steps in the design of ingenuity. And uh, especially after a successful test flights on Mars, we can relax uh, a number of those things. And we believe with uh, some improvements in the airfoil design, uh, increasing the allowable tip mark numbers uh, and so forth, uh, we can actually get to a system that could carry a payload of about a kilogram which by itself may not be that interesting, but definitely something of this size paired with a lander, which has more sophisticated uh, assets, uh, is something that uh, you know is a possibility for a future uh, mission. Now, all of this um, has been captured, uh, including a number of uh, mission variants, uh, um, you know, into a, a white paper that was uh, you know put together by an extended team at JPL and across the country, actually. Uh, as part of the uh, uh, decadal uh, white paper process. And so I would encourage those of you who are interested in looking at, uh, you know, what are all the science capabilities that uh, future helicopters might bring to the table to go and read the, uh, uh, the decadal uh, paper, uh, Mars helicopter. So some of the science themes that uh, are clearly enabled by um, such, a, such systems and which are described in much more detail in the white paper, is everything from sort of the classic geological kinds of things, um, 
sedimentology stratigraphy. A lot of interest in uh, polar and mid latitude sites where there are exposed uh, ice carps and volatiles, uh, being able to get up close to them. Uh, there also is a role for profiling things in the boundary layer, uh, looking at chemical compositions. So essentially everybody who does atmospheric science could benefit from such a platform. Uh, but to me personally, the exciting ones are all related to astrobiology. Uh, we can probably get to places uh, which are, uh, uh, you know, have significant possibility of astrobiological uh, things. Uh, the stuff on geophysics, uh, the range and um, mobility of this platform lets you do a lot of wide area magnetic sensing, for example, for crustal magnetic field measurements. So that's an area with geophysics. And then the other thing that I think we think is particularly useful for these are small vehicles. Uh, we believe we can get them sterilized and clean enough to actually go and explore some sensitive regions uh, without any risk of you know, contamination, if you will. Um, so that's kind of the possibility. So all of these, along with some representative mission profiles and mission concepts are um, in, the white, in the white paper. And we are actively working across this, uh, both at JPL and with our other NASA and industrial partners to advance the system. Uh, the idea being that if we have a successful uh, uh, summer with our test flight program, then uh, these are all the things that we can bring to the table for future missions uh, and see what, what uh, gets traction from the larger community. With that, I wanted to leave time for questions, and so I will uh, take questions at this time. Hello, Mr. Baller. I'm sorry about that. This is uh, Lucinda Offer. How are you? <laughs> good. I have, good. I have a question for you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Ingenuity is so exciting. Uh, what, someone wants to know here, would you like to fly a balloon on a future Mars missions? And what are the advantages or disadvantages of helicopters versus balloons on Mars? Right. So in fact, uh, many years ago, uh, there was a major uh, uh, Mars balloon study uh, that we looked at. Uh, and in fact, I believe the French even have a balloon sitting in a warehouse that they never managed to launch because of some problems with the inflation system. So. There are some engineering challenges uh, related to balloon uh, inflation, uh, balloon films, uh, long, long uh, duration, uh, so forth. But I think the biggest uh, advantage that a rotorcraft system has is sort of the precision of being able to maneuver to exactly the point you want to. Uh, we're not at mercy so much against the atmospheric winds. And so we can get up close and personal to a lot of interesting features on, on Mars, which uh, balloons, uh, by and large have had issues where, uh, you know, they're subject to sort of uh, fighting the wind a lot um, and not having that degree of control authority to sort of necessarily stay in place. Uh, not to say it can't be done. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, if you put enough engineering into it, the uh, balloon system uh, can also be done, but um, inflation and deployment of a balloon system is a highly non-trivial uh, exercise as the French found out um, in their uh, balloon, project from, you know, for the 1990s. And I think that would still continue to be a challenge. Hello, this is Carrie Fay, and I have your next question. Um, this is asked by Carlos Glender. Given the high RPM of rotor blades, 200, and, I'm sorry, 2,500 to 300 RPM and the high propensity of sand on Mars, is there a concern about rotor blade erosion? Yeah, that's one of the things we will find. Now, you should, the, the rotor flow uh, is you know, basically taking air from above the helicopter and pushing it down. Uh, we do not, our modeling to date indicates that we do not set up any significant recirculation you know, of the dust and soil you know, within the system. Uh, and once we, Soon as we achieve our target RPM, we very quickly, you know, uh, change the blade pitch and we pop up quite quickly. And uh, once we get to about one rotor diameter above the surface, uh, uh, the dust is the dust impingement issues are all quite minor. Uh, but yes, it's something that uh, we one of the reasons we're going to Mars is to see exactly what all of those phenomena are and how they impact us. But uh, the current thinking is that. Um, you know, we really don't expect to have much of an impingement from uh, anything that we stir up. 
Okay, I'm uh, going to ask you the next question, and uh, I didn't mean to turn my camera off. Can I do that? So, um, you know, we, we recently saw an avalanche happen on on Mars. So we've got Priya here. Uh, they're um, interested to, to know if you're going to sample that the helicopter might take a look at maybe some of the Martian slopes, the seasonal flows that happen. Right. So, in not this helicopter. This helicopter's sole job is to provide engineering data so that we can validate and be ready for the next generation, the design of the next generation systems. Uh, so we actually will, are learning how to operate the system. We have learned how to test these systems. That was all, you know, kind of writing the book on that because there was, that was all backbreaking work. But yes, the future systems, again, with the ability to do extended hover, uh, extended close-up proximity operations are definitely things like the recursive slope linear, the RSLs, and other things, uh, you know, those, whether they are of uh, biological uh, interest or not, I think the, 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 Sentiment in the community goes up and down on that one, but uh, definitely ice scarps, uh, RSLs are all places where we can send such systems, uh, both for um, sort of standoff imaging as well as even some. We've been looking at some uh, standoff uh, sampling types of uh, systems that can actually uh, retrieve uh, certain samples from it under those conditions. So, definitely, those are in the mission architectures and mission concepts for uh, future helicopters. Hi, your next question is from Andy Ware. If everything goes well with the current mission goals, does the copter have the potential to do more? Um, for example, number of flights, distance? Yeah, so the, the ground rules that we have is that we get everything done in 30 sols, 30 Martian days after we get deployed. The, the whole Perseverance team and the agency has been incredibly you know, gracious in giving us those precious 30 days out of their very exciting, you know, science campaign, and we don't want to be in the way of uh, absolutely, you know, getting in the way of continuing with the rest of the mission. So we get deployed early in the phase where just after the initial commissioning, and uh, so we likely in some sense be right part of their transition to their full mission, uh, but we have no plans on doing anything beyond our 30 sols. So I have a question for you. She's a 13 year old and she wants to be an engineer. Um, and she, she's curious to know how long will Ingenuity continue to work without humans on Mars to maintain it? We, as I said, on the 30 day mark, the experiment ends. And so, and the rover will go off to do its very exciting signs of, you know, getting samples ready for to bring back to Earth. So it's very much like the Sojourner model, you know, that you had back in the 1990s. Uh, that was a little, you know, microwave box size thing. And it was, did a short mission, but it paved the way for spirit and opportunity and curiosity and perseverance. So in the sim very similar way, this is a very definite objective and a very definite, uh, you know, lifetime. Uh, and so I should also point out that from an engineering sense, uh, we have used a fair number of commercial parts and none of them have been, you know, stress tested, if you will, to see if they last, you know, three times, you know, you know, a long mission. So we are definitely, we are not designed for long, very long life. Uh, also, Ingenuity in particular is, uh, will not be able to harvest enough energy in the winter months to sort of uh, keep itself, you know, um, alive and so forth. So it's a very targeted kind of tech demo, which is really designed for the particulars of this uh, experimental window we are in. Thank you so much. Your next question comes from Michael Bushro. In reference to your main work, is there any success in increasing the upper limit on lander mass due to EDL into a thin atmosphere? Well, I think this, uh, I, I'm not sure there's any relationship between the helicopter work and EDL. EDL has, uh, you know, is a separate problem, which I worked on for many years before I started working on the helicopter. Um, and uh, there are, you know, high and lower D uh, vehicle designs, which are, you know, a, would be a departure from the 70 degree half cone systems that we've been using for our payloads. And definitely, if you want to go into the multiple ton uh, delivery of uh, uh, cargo and humans to Mars, uh, you go with more with those uh, uh, mid and lower D lift to drag, um, sort of more gliding type vehicles rather than a ballistic entry 
type of uh, blunt cone that we have. So there's very active work at NASA and other places uh, on those kinds of systems. And so people are actively doing it, but I don't think anything in the helicopter world necessarily pertains to, pertains to that. We are more of a asset of what you do once you get there, whether you're a, a scout for a science mission or whether a future astronaut uses these drones, much like people use, here, use them here on Earth to, you know, survey or scout out or pick an optimum route or decide which place to go to, uh, that will be the role for these systems, not so much to inform uh, the next generation of EDL. Just waiting for a cue to see if I would like to ask you one more question, if that's okay, I'm going oh. to go ahead because I'm from, Na I worked in NASA Ames from Silicon Valley and we had dirigibles there. Um, and this will be the last question. Uh, we have our next speaker coming up, but uh, William Hale asked an interesting question. Any plans for dirigibles? I know that takes us away from the copter, but it's a great question. Well, I think uh, if I understand you dirigible as being a tethered balloon platform, I think uh, you have the same issues. Uh, you know, uh, it's tied to one place. Uh, you have inflation and deployment under either entry, descent, and landing conditions, which are quite uncertain in terms of you don't really know what the atmosphere is doing when you try to inflate on your way down. Or uh, even on the surface, you know, inflating on the surface uh, is, is non-trivial. And then you have the lifetime. You have to have uh, materials which, uh, you know, are sort of don't leak as much. So it, it's... It's the same situation as with the balloons in the past. I think uh, we have looked at them. I'm not, I'm not to say they can't be made to work and they may have a role in future Mars exploration too. It's just that for very specific point-to-point uh, -point observations, you know, the rotorcraft seems like a better solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. I'm gonna move it over to Dr. Zubrin who's going to introduce our next speaker. Very interesting talk on the copter on Mars, and I wish it all the best. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm very hopeful for this helicopter experiment. We need to start flying on Mars. Our next uh, speaker is going to be Anastasia Stepanova. Um, uh, I first met Anastasia when Hope and I went to Russia in 2013, and uh, she uh, was one of the people to help arrange our tour there. And um, she became so inspired by what the Mars Society was doing that she decided to go back to school. She became an engineer uh, and she has participated in both Mars Society activities. She was a member of the Mars 160 crew um, and uh, I must say was a real trooper. The, she had a visa problem that stopped her from getting to America um, until um, the crew uh, was already on Resolute Bay, ready to leave for Devon Island. And finally her visa came through and she did a mad dash from Moscow to Los Angeles, to Toronto, to Ottawa, to, 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 to whatever, to six different islands and finally made it to Resolute Bay just before the crew took off for, for, for the island. So that was fantastic. Um, and uh, she's now a researcher at the Institute for Biomedical problems in Moscow, you know, where they did the Mars 500 mission and the Sirius mission. And now she herself is engaged in a long-term um, zero gravity uh, isolation and health effects mission. So uh, without further ado, here's Anastasia Stepanova. Hello, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to give a talk at Mars Tech Convention. It became my Martian family. So I'm very happy to do that again. Um, okay, so I'll do the share of the screen. Okay, here you go. Okay, so um, I've been taking part in isolation experiment held by Institute of Biomedical Problems, which was founded in uh, 60s in order to help uh, humans to stay safely, healthy, and comfortable in space. So we study space medicine and space biology. And uh, yes, we did a lot of isolation experiments, but also we are famous for dry immersion experiments. Um, the history of this experiment starts a long time ago. Uh, when the uh, Soyuz 9 mission in 1970s um, held, had 17 days flying in spaceship, 
And of course, spaceship was small, so uh, two cosmonauts didn't have uh, much of the movement. So when they landed back to Earth, they couldn't even stand by themselves. They had really uh, bad muscle atrophy and heart problems. And this situation led um, to the question, what can we do here on Earth? Uh, to uh, as a countermeasures for negative effect of microgravity. So our scientists decided to have a dry immersion experiment. But first it was actually wet immersion. Uh, test subject were laying in a bath um, and uh, they were actually touching the water, which led to um, skin problems and also the oil from skin of the test subject caused um, health problems. After that, uh, it was decided to have a dry immersion, uh, which is a bath filled with uh, warm water. And uh, this water is always between 32, uh, 32 degree or 34, it depends uh, what test subject will ask you, which is more comfortable for him. And um, it covered with a waterproof uh, film. So uh, the test subject uh, is actually not uh, uh, not touching the water itself. And the longest experiment was carried out by its creators, uh, and it was in 1974. It's 56 days. Back then, uh, was proven that uh, it's quite good model of uh, microgravity effect on human body. Uh, of course, we have another microgravity simulation, which is uh, parabolic flights, but you have only 20, 30 seconds of it. So you can't really um, test the, what, how the muscle atrophy evolve. And uh, you can't bring a lot of equipment to test different techniques. I, of course, many would ask, uh, why would we need um, dry immersion if we have astronauts and cosmonauts flying to ISS? Uh, it's still a sm uh, small number of statistics and uh, you can bring all the equipment to ISS because it's very expensive. And every year we have um, some new ideas, uh, new devices to create countermeasures for negative effect of microgravity and actually to test it here on earth. So for this uh, dry immersion is a quite perfect uh, model. And in order to have real um, effect of microgravity, you need to uh, have simultaneously uh, three factors. It's a lack of support. So you're floating. Uh, and uh, this is the key in uh, postural muscular system. Second, it's limitation in motor activity. We call it hyperdynamia and hyperkinesia. So hyperdynamia, um, it's usually decreased in postural muscular load uh, and hyperkinesia is decreased in uh, physical activity in general. And third factor is hydrostatic compression, uh, basically uh, compression of surface tissue and blood vessels, which leads to uh, redistribution of uh, blood from lower part of the body to upper part of the body. And all of that we have in dry immersion. So usually uh, in the modern days, we had dry immersion for duration of three, five, seven, and 21 days. And until October the 3rd, uh, 2020, uh, dry immersion was only with male test subject. Uh, dry immersion beds are not only in uh, Institute of Biomedical Problems, but also in France, in Medes. And that's it, only in two places in the world. And, um, I didn't believe that uh, for the first time, I was the first uh, female test subject in such an experiment. Uh, of course, we, um, I mean, in Russia, we had only four women who uh, flew to space. So there is not much of statistics on how uh, women body reacts to microgravity. And um, therefore, we are starting now the series of uh, dry immersion experiments with female test subject. In um, this year, we would have six test subjects. So on the 3rd of October, um, I started the dry immersion experiment. And next day, Yelena Luchitska, my <laughs> co-partner, uh, she started um, her dry immersion experiment. So we've been um, 
laying down there uh, in for three days. And um, we had 24 seven uh, shifts with uh, a doctor on duty, technician and um, helper. Uh, he was, uh, or she was doing everything that we asked, basically bringing food, uh, toilet and uh, whatever we ask, which is not uh, of course the best job, but um, the team was really amazing and supportive and they uh, treated it as a real space mission. In this experiment, uh, we had more than 20 uh, experiments. <laughs> so uh, of course, before the dry immersion starts, we uh, tested all of them uh, to have um, all the data, how we behave, how our, our body behaves um, in the normal earth conditions. Then we had some experiments during the dry immersion and of course after, which is really um, the most interesting and crucial data that uh, our scientists got. And I will tell you a bit about them. So for example, experiment food. Um, it's uh, interesting that during um, microgravity, during flying on ISS, uh, some cosmonauts uh, had uh, flat feet uh, that as effect of uh, microgravity and that you don't really use your food. Uh, so it also, the shape of it changes. And you can see here, it's a special device that scans your feet. And then uh, here on the right, you see a special point which shows the, the difference before and after. Uh, next experiment is dynamometer. Basically, uh, it's uh, the study of precision of uh, hand movements. Special device that I uh, that you see here in my right hand. Uh, it's quite hard to squeeze it, so you have to do it. And then, um, in another session, you have to do it uh, like uh, start to do it from uh, a small movement, then harder, harder, and the maximum, and then the opposite. Um, and again, you do it with the closed eyes so you can see uh, your improvement. It's quite interesting. Uh, and after this session, they give you the list uh, where uh, there is a colors, just red, green, blue, and yellow, just the words. And in um, you have to read them very fast. Then they give you the colors itself and you have to name them also very fast. And then they give you again the words red, green, blue, but all colored in different colors. And you have to read it no matter which colors they're painted. Uh, this to test your cognitive abilities and how they're changing also and how this connects with your hand movement. Uh, another experiment is Ash Reflex. Um, basically it's how uh, your leg muscles respond to a small electrical stimulation. And interesting that in the beginning before the dry immersion, um, my uh, pain limit was quite high. <laughs> and uh, after dry, I mean, it, after dry immersion, yes, it was uh, much lower. So uh, uh, this really changes even in three days. Uh, microcirculation, uh, here we study also the state of microvascular veins. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, here on the right picture, uh, my, uh, the circulation of my veins on a, on a monitor. Pose, uh, it's really interesting uh, experiment. So you uh, have to uh, stand on a firm surface with closed eyes and uh, start nodding with your head. Then they give you a soft surface and you do the same. Uh, after that, you stand again on a uh, firm surface and they push you uh, and you with closed eyes. So you don't know when will be the push and how hard it will be. It uh, starts with quite uh, soft push and then with harder one and they wait when you stumble. After that, uh, you close your eyes and have to walk the line. So uh, imagine that this experiment was held just after they take you out from the bath on the third day and uh, transform you horizontally. And the first time you ever stand horizontally, uh, it's this uh, experiment pose. And of course, uh, there was situation with other test subjects in the past uh, when uh, they fainted or fall. 
or they couldn't do proper movement. Uh, and um, I remember my experience uh, when finally I was standing there vertically and had to do all this uh, exercise. Uh, my heart started to pump quite fast because uh, it usually were in, was in horizontal position. And also I start to sweat it a little bit, uh, but uh, if you concentrate, you can do it great. Uh, and funny that uh, there came people from even other laboratories just to look um, how I would fall or, or maybe not, but yeah, they were surprised that I didn't uh, fail. So that's good. <laughs> and the next experiment, uh, we had of course, uh, a little bit of psychology and psychological support. Uh, Every, two times uh, per day, I had to record small videos of how I feel, uh, not only physically, but also mentally. Uh, then do a cognitive test. Uh, one of them is Lucier test, maybe you heard of it. Um, when you have to choose from the most likable color to the least uh, unlikable. <laughs> Uh, and uh, other experiments on uh, your memory, also the calculation. Um, and uh, so also they uh, test how these cognitive uh, abilities change over the time of dry immersion. As psychological support, uh, we used VR and um, it's actually very immersive. For example, I chose video with skydiving and you're floating and also you have the video of skydiving. The uh, effect was really great. Um, I felt that I'm really diving and uh, landing on Earth. So uh, I think we can also use it uh, for real space flights. Uh, another experiment is the tone. Tone um, is uh, using special device. Uh, we have um, to record the response of muscles to mechanical touch with the probe with only a force of 0 0.4 Newton. Uh, and interesting that I didn't even uh, feel this touch, but my muscles already reacted. And uh, here on the picture, you see the experiment TMS, which is uh, basically magnet, um, the magnetic impulses sent uh, to your brain uh, and uh, your muscles contract. So here you see not the blood on my head, actually this is the red mark and uh, where uh, they have to put this uh, black device. So they send magnetic impulse starting from uh, 40% uh, and reaching to 100. And it's uh, really impressive. So before immersion, I react totally normal. Maybe my uh, left uh, leg was a little bit moving, but that's it. And after dry immersion, um, when, when there was a magnetic signal sent to my brain, my both legs were jumping. <laughs> so uh, that's really interesting how, uh, um, how body reacted to that. And how, of course, we've been living in this bath for three days. Hygiene and daily routine. Uh, whenever we had to eat, to brush, it, brush teeth or do some experiments, they were giving us pillows so we could kind of like a sit. Uh, but all of other time we were laying down. And um, of course uh, was interesting moment with the toilet. Uh, since for doing, for peeing uh, for men, it's much easier than for women. Uh, our employee Svetlana Lebedeva, she created a special device and uh, as you can see, there are several funnels and um, pump. And this is the prototype. So we've been also testing prototype uh, toilet system. Uh, and it's quite complicated because your body used to do it vertically. And here you have to be horizontally and plus without any support for your body. So you're floating and uh, very interesting. Um, psychological blocks also occur. Um, all your life, uh, especially your childhood, you've been taught not to spill, right? <laughs> not to pee in your bed. 
Uh, and here you have to do opposite because you test this prototype, you have to relax and just test it. Um, all our scientists were saying, Anastasia, don't worry if you spill it and we will clean everything. You know, we just need to uh, test this prototype and make it as comfortable as possible. So this process uh, took uh, quite a long time and we've been adapting to this uh, for several days. Um, and of course you would think, okay, so what to do with number two? Uh, every, uh, every day we had 15 minutes for a shower and for number two. Uh, they take us out, move horizontally to the special bath that you can see on the right. And you have to take a shower horizontally. That's also really unusual experience. And um, everything takes much longer time. And um, 15 minutes is so short for <laughs> two main uh, duties, which is number two and shower. <laughs> so uh, when the 15 minutes end, they take you out no matter what. Why 15 minutes? Because if, if it's longer than 15 minutes, then the uh, effect of microgravity uh, can be as not as not good as you know if if more than, if less than 15 minutes. Um, and yes, so uh, apart from that, uh, of course, different test subject body. Um, usually, uh, when it was with men, uh, most thing that they faced uh, was back pain. Your um, spine decompressed, and uh, that can cause back pain. Uh, for example, in two days, uh, I gained one, uh, one and a half centimeter, and I lost two kilograms. But uh, basically, I lost a liquid because of redistribution of uh, fluid in your body and that your uh, organism is so smart, it wants to lower the pressure, blood pressure, and it starts to get rid of the liquid. So in the first day, I lost two liters. Uh, and uh, the change is so rapid and your body keeps surprising you how uh, it reacts to this really unusual environment. And it's interesting that three days, there is adaptation of the body. And then after three days, you finally start to feel good. But we didn't have this opportunity. So we just started to adaptate to dry immersion, to microgravity. And then they took us out and we had to readaptate to earth gravity, which was a really interesting feeling. Uh, and um, of course, it's not as easy as many would think that you're just laying down on uh, um, like in a bath and that's cool. Everyone was saying, oh, I would like to do that. Um, it's, it's good for first few hours. And actually we have these dry immersion beds in, in clinics because uh, uh, it can really help uh, old people and people with needs. But uh, when you stay there for several days, you feel um, really different effect and uh, very challenging. And of course, you can all uh, get through this if you have sense of humor. Here, how we had fun with <laughs> my partner in crime. And um, I'm ready to have a questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, this is Carrie Faye. Um, following you along with this um, on your Facebook post were just amazing to me. And so your first question is actually for me. Um, what do you think was the hardest, most difficult thing that you had to endure doing this entire, during this entire process? Oh, I'm ashamed to say that, but actually to learn how to pee. <laughs> yes, uh, it was quite uh, complicated. Uh, and um, you really surprised how such an easy thing that you do usually in your life becomes so challenging there in space. Wonderful. The next question I'm going to ask you comes from Dr. Robert Slater. He is asking, can you simulate the counter effects of exercise in space and see how that impacts the subjects in dry immersion to see if those attempts on space station, um, on the space station are working? 
Yes, in previous uh, dry immersion experiments, they had uh, electrostimulation. Uh, so basically two hours of electric stimulation on your leg muscles worth of two hours of walking in a park. So yeah, we tested this also. <laughs> Great, your next question is going to come from Lucinda. Oh, thanks, Carrie. Anastasia, so great to um, mm -hmm. hear your talk. And uh, I know that you did a lot of work with Sirius. And I was wondering, um, you know, what's what's coming up for Sirius? I think you did a four month, um, uh, a four month mission. What's going on with that? What's next? Uh, yes, next we will have eight months a serious mission. Uh, I won't be in the crew, <laughs> but I'm helping to organize it and uh, to make uh, this mission as um, interesting and comfortable for next crew as possible. I was wondering, uh, are there what kind of experiments that are they going to do for the new missions? I, th I think you told me you were part of helping out with experiments with IBMP. Yes, uh, basically they would have the same experiment that were in four months because um, NASA human research programs, they want to have all the same experiments, the same environment and just different duration, like four months, eight months, then we have one year and one year again. So we will just change the crews, uh, but all the experiments, it's uh, about 90 experiments. It's on physiology, psychology, microbiology, immune system, uh, Calvin here has a question. How was your sleep affected? Did you sleep more, less, short naps? Oh, right. Yes, forgot to <laughs> talk about that. Um, the first night I was waking up around like three times, but just to change the position, but you can't do much. You can, you know, sleep on your belly. So you, you start to, you, you try to find something different. Uh, second night I slept like a baby. And uh, last night was not, um, I, I woke up at 4 a.m. and uh, maybe I was too excited about it. I will be getting out of the uh, dry immersion. I don't know, maybe it was adaptation, but yeah, I had just uh, maybe uh, five hours of sleep. Anastasia, your next question is from Anna Lyon. And she's actually in London, and she would like to know how you are feeling um, in the aftermath of the experiment, and do you have any other experience, uh, experiments lined up? Uh, yes, I, I actually, after the uh, dry immersion finished, um, I was uh, sleeping so good. <laughs> but uh, interesting thing, for the um, next three uh, nights that I slept on, on Earth, the moment when I was waking up, I felt that I'm floating. So this effect kind of lasted. Um, and uh, also after experiment finishes, you have like a, about a five days of uh, all the tests and experiments uh, that can uh, record uh, the changes. So uh, also um, there were changes even in my uh, heart muscle only in three days, which is crazy how fast your uh, organism can, you know, adapt to something new. Uh, and um, also, uh, next, oh, the last question that uh, you said, what's next? Um, well, I don't know, uh, we'll see. I'm looking forward to be in other new experiments. And again, I will try harder to get to a space program. So, um, yeah, we'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anastasia. We have time for one more question. Um, there's a few questions asking about, um, to tell us just a little more about the psychological experiences. If you could maybe pick one um, to tell us with the time remaining, that would be wonderful. Uh, to, uh to tell uh, about what kind of psychological uh, experiment was or my experience? Sorry. Your experience. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so this is uh, not for people who are um, claustrophobic for sure. And I was thinking that I started with uh, Mars 160 program at Mars at MDRS. So uh, there we had isolation, but we still could go out uh, in um, spacesuits. Then I got to uh, IBMP project uh, where we were isolated and we couldn't even get out. We didn't see the sunlight, uh, nature, nothing. 
And uh, now I put myself even in more confined <laughs> space. So uh, now I was in one room uh, in, a, in a small bath and covered with foil with water. So uh, you had all the time pressure of the water on your legs, on your stomach. And for some people, of course, it can be scary, very uh, uncomfortable, but it's all in your mindset. If you understand why you're doing this and also the high motivation of it, for me, it was very important uh, to show that women uh, are as good as men to fly to space, to um, be in those challenges and that we are quite robust. Uh, so for me, it was really high motivational experience. Uh, and um, I think if not the um, like small difficulties with uh, just hygiene stuff, then uh, it will be very, um, very light for me and easy. And I would uh, love to try to be in a longer one, like five or seven days. Okay. Hello, Anastasia. I've got a question for you, which is uh, that you're starting, you're going to do an eight month serious experiment. Are you looking for volunteers? If Mar Society members want to volunteer to be in the crew, to what address should they send their resume? Yes, of course, we are still looking for volunteers for eight months. So uh, they can write me on social media and I will be happy to choose someone. <laughs> All right, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. From Russia as <laughs> well. <laughs> yes, you are definitely part of the Mars Society family. We always um, love hearing from you. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Okay, I'm gonna go on to our next speaker. We are privileged to have with us, Jonathan Weintraub is co-founder of Space IL, a 100 million Israeli nonprofit organization that attempted to land Bereshit, the first private interplanetary robotic mission which landed on the moon on April 11, 2019, making Israel only the seventh nation ever to orbit the moon and reach the lunar surface. Space IL has reached over 1 million children with this mission, which goal was to inspire the next generation of space researchers and to promote STEM education and scientific exploration. Thank you for being with us. Hi guys, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, can you see my slides or are you seeing my uh, yeah. interview? Yes. All yeah, right, yeah. perfect. All right. So thanks guys, uh, and I'm happy to share the story uh, about the first private mission uh, that landed on the moon. We heard from a lot of really interesting speakers at the past conference and you know, very distinguished scientists. And for those younger audience, I wanna say like nobody starts that uh, senior. Um, and you really have to take steps to get there. For me, the first step was uh, Legos. I was a fan of Legos. I built robots and Legos ever since I was a kid. Um, and that, for me, doing Legos in space is the ultimate, um, the, the ultimate challenge. So actually, Legos is it was my start, and I hopefully some of the audience have done this. So uh, something like that in their um, uh, play with Legos. Uh, I just want to say we also uh, one of the fans of the mission set up this uh, Lego uh, Bereshit model. You can see it here. Um, and if you're interested in that, you know, go to that QR code here and vote it up so that Lego would actually make. Uh, Space IL uh, uh, Moon Lander Lego kit. I am actually looking forward to that. Uh, about 10 years ago, I uh, went to the International Space University at NASA Ames, and uh, that um, I joined with a group of about 100 scientists from all around the world that were studying how we can we utilize um, Martian lava caves to search for shelter on the lunar, on the moon surf on Mars surface. Um, and that was a very interesting study to try to see how can we create habitats over there. And in that, uh, in that kind of uh, setting, I also got to know a competition that was set up by Google called Google Lunar X Prize. And that competition was to send a private robotic mission to the moon. And I got really interested because the concept of being able to do a private mission and get to the moon was really interesting because at the time, you know, only governments and superpowers were able to do that. And if, you know, private individuals can give a, get, get a shot and actually do that, that would be really, really exciting. And I, I kind of thought about how to do this and, you know, the plans didn't work out and I kind of put the plans in the drawer until I met with those two guys, Yariv and Fear, in a bar and the idea kind of spun out 
and we decided, yeah, we're we're gonna do this. We're gonna we're gonna get uh, the first private mission and land it on the surface of the moon. And obviously, the first thought that came to my mind was, woohoo, we're we're going for the moon. You know, this is this is it. We're doing it. Well, turns out, getting to the surface of the moon requires a team. It requires a lot of very talented engineers that are going to work together to make this. And you also need to have the expertise and and know how and facilities to do so. So us, Space AL, we joined forces with one of the major um, contractor that makes satellites, um, which is called Israeli Aerospace Industries, IAI, and together we built Bereshit. What I, uh, I was really surprised to see is, look, this, is, this picture is the entire team that actually built the spaceship. The spaceship. And what NASA did you know, 60, 70 years ago took hundreds of thousands of people. And now you can fit all of them in one room to make a very, very small spacecraft. And that's exciting time because you can see technology moves so fast, devices become smaller and smaller, and then maybe one day you can send your own uh, moon landers and get to the surface of the moon. This is a uh, bare sheet. It says it's about the size of a coffee table and weighs as much as a Mini Cooper. You can see a few things here. Uh, you can see the landing legs here in gold. You can see the fuel tanks. These are the ovals, the spheres over there. The spaceship needs a lot of fuel to get to the moon. It's pretty far. And you can see some sensors. There are some sensors that call star trackers. These are looking at the night sky to figure out how the spaceship is oriented. And you can see that the computers are so small that uh, you barely can see them. You can see some boxes around. And these are the computers and the uh, avionics of the mission itself. This is the smallest spacecraft. And here, weight does matter. If you can make a small spaceship, it it's actually costs less money, and you can actually get it to the surface of the moon. We set up uh, Space IL as a nonprofit. We thought that we can do something which is much bigger than landing on the moon. We thought we can inspire kids, pursue careers in science and engineering. And that was a big part of that mission, to get kids interested about space. And I'll touch that in a moment. But because we're a private nonprofit, we could not afford doing spaceships the, the usual way, the way that usually NASA and other uh, really big space companies are doing it. We had to you know, kind of use McGarvey style techniques and get there. One of the things is how do you get yourself to the launch pad? Well, most uh, companies, they, they rent a plane and they fly their, their spacecraft and uh, get it onto the launch pad. Well, we couldn't afford that. So you can see we loaded up the, the bare sheet in this container here. And then some oranges, and we all ride-shared our path to the launch pad uh, to save some save some costs. So I think that was the first spaceship that actually was co-passenger with some oranges on the way to the launch pad. The night of the launch was was spectacular. We were launching on board a Falcon 9 SpaceX rocket, and uh, uh, it's a night launch, so you can actually see the moon. And we saw the rocket moving towards the moon. That was kind of exciting, but the, the sky was bright yellow, and you can see uh, the entire sky lit up. And the pictures that we got from, from, from there was spectacular. This is, was one of the photographers uh, that was uh, taking pictures of the rocket. And you can see that's, that's really amazing. As I mentioned, one a big part of the mission is to inspire kids. And how do you, how do you reach the young audience? How do you reach kids uh, that are you know, in social media all the time and their um, news move fast? Well, we thought we can take some selfies. So we took a selfie. Uh, this is uh, a, a, the spacecraft itself. This view is from within the spaceship, looking on one of the legs of the spaceship. And you can see we have uh, Earth around there, and we have a nice black. And another thing that we took with us to the surface of the moon is a time capsule. Uh, you can see it over here. These are, um, we, we took uh, about 30 million pages of books and Wikipedia and dictionaries. And we took uh, pictures from that people send us from all around the world. And you can see this is, this is uh, really written on the, on the time capsule that was made by the ARC Mission Foundation. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit on one of those, on one of those circles that you can see over here. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the pages are really inscribed into, into, the, into the metal. And uh, there's some calculations that were done that uh, this, this entire thing actually survived. We call it hard landing. We don't call it a crash. Uh, it survived the hard landing on the surface of the moon. So future generations or kids that are interested, there are really interesting uh, books and some letters that we wrote that you can actually go and find it. And I encourage you to bring some of this back. Uh, I have uh, another, another part of it. This is uh, uh, another one of those circles. And I see how well the camera is. Well, you can't read the pages, but you, you can really appreciate like how small you can actually get uh, those uh, pictures and images. And uh, we have drawings of kids there that do what science means to them and so on and so forth.
we did a, a few orbits around the Earth. We didn't do a trajectory, a direct trajectory towards the moon. And again, the reason is cost. We wanted to share the launch with another with another satellite. So when you're doing ride sharing, basically Uber of space flight, you can't do a direct trajectory towards the moon. So we did a few revolutions around the Earth. And you can see these is, uh, pictures that we took from one of the orbits. Um, and you know, see, seeing Earth from outer space is really, it's really exciting. Um, beyond the the natural questions of, you know, you're using a very basic camera. How do you expose it? How do you make sure the pictures look good? The fact that you can see the entire Earth as a, as a whole in one picture is, is really uh, is really remarkable. It's somewhat of an overview effect, although I was never in space. On April of last year, uh, we captured with the moon and we became the first private interplanetary mission. So this is the first time that a private organization uh, was capturing uh, with the moon. We took this picture, which is kind of exciting. This picture cannot be taken from Earth. Uh, the reason is this is what uh, Pink Floyd called the dark side of the moon. Uh, it's not dark, it's just the far side of the moon. Uh, the moon and the Earth are in the phase lock. So it means that the moon rotates uh, such that we see the same side uh, no matter uh, what time of month it is. And that side uh, you can see over here is the far side. So uh, we, we kind of took a nice picture of that. The landing itself is a really interesting uh, process. So um, we're traveling around the moon at this point at about roughly two kilometers per second. Uh, we're approaching the, the surface of the moon at about two kilometers per second. And we need to slow down this enormous velocity to zero. And, and we have about 15 minutes to do so. Now, unlike other planets, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So we can't use parachutes to slow us down and airbags don't work in the speed, which is you know, faster than a bullet. The only thing we could do was to point our rocket engines and fire as hard as we can to slow that enormous velocity to zero. And we have to do this in a precise timing because if we miss it and if we're, not, uh, if we're too, too fast or too slow, we're for sure to hit the surface of the moon. So that was a really tense time. You can see uh, we were aiming to land in that spot on the right top side of the moon. Um, so that was uh, where we were heading. And we were slowing down um, that enormous velocity within 15 minutes. The tension was high in the control rooms. Um, one of the reasons is that when you're that close to the surface of the moon, you can see mountain ranges, you can see the mountains come up and every mistake that, you're, uh, that your spacecraft might be doing and it's for sure gonna crash on one of the sides of those mountain ranges. So you need to make sure that your calculation is correct. And we have a team that was working on exactly that, making sure that the calculations are correct and we're not gonna do that. And uh, you can see that uh, all of us uh, were watching the, the, the spacecraft as it was coming down. Uh, these are, um, you know, you can see the different disciplines here. Um, there's uh, some software, there's some propulsion, there's system engineering, all of those people were watching uh, the spacecraft as it was approaching the surface of the moon. And the first couple of minutes of the landing was spectacular by the book. You can see some data that was coming from the spacecraft. Those uh, oranges are their are engines and they're orange. Those circles are engines and they're orange, meaning that the engines are working properly. You can see our altitude, our speed, um, and uh, we were coming down pretty nicely. Uh, so we did the obvious thing and uh, took another selfie, this time with the surface of the moon. And you can see here on the, on the side, you actually see some of those mountain ranges. Uh, as a spacecraft approaching the surface of the moon, unfortunately, a couple, you know, one or a couple, a few minutes before touchdown, we had an error that maybe I can refer to in the Q and A. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't land as we wanted. This is a picture that was taken uh, by NASA. I put the spacecraft here just to orient ourselves. We were coming from north to south, and this is the before picture, and this is the after. Before, after. You know, every startup wants to make an impact. Well, we certainly did one. Uh, I have a friend that says, you know, you know, if you crash a party, you still had a good time. And uh, yeah, so there is a new crater now in the surface of the moon, the Bereshit crater. We hoped for a, a software landing, software landing. And uh, there were some calculations that were done regarding like what is, um, like how big it is and what was the energy that was released in that impact. And it turns out that probably the most of the energy came from from the kinetic energy, so the fact that we were coming in so so fast towards the surface, um, and this is why you can see this kind of scratch uh, on the on the surface of the moon. It's, these are parts that basically continued and were scattered there. It should be a really interesting sight to see what's going on there and uh, to see you know what, what which pieces survived and how did it land 
um, and hopefully uh, we can we can learn better. But again, I encourage uh, those of you our younger generation uh, build your own rocket ship and, and go there. I really want to see how it looks like. From uh, impact uh, to on the moon, let's go on impact uh, here on Earth. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that we were really interested in is to get kids interested in science and engineering. So we have a big team of volunteers, and you know, this is a shout out to all the volunteers that kind of get the message of space is cool, engineering is cool, and you know, kids are a lot interested in becoming a celebrity and a rock star. You know, I gotta admit, I, I watch the shots of Sunset and I, and I enjoy it and I like it, but we also need engineers and scientists to move society forward and to get us to Mars. So uh, we have those volunteering team, but they went school to school, door to door and touch those kids. And one of the interesting part is that kids get really excited about the possibility of going to the moon, about building their own moon shots. And that generation is gonna be challenged with the greatest challenges that there is, right? We have global warming, we have aging population, uh, we have climate change, we have uh, a lot of challenges are COVID that are coming towards us, but these kids, they have the greatest tools that ever we ever had, right? Technology moves so fast, we can really move forward and get some, some real uh, ground cover. And we just need them to dream forward. And this is what one of our main messages here is like, if these kids need to reach and grab it technology would catch up. I'm asked a lot about uh, what's next and I, I cannot share a lot because we haven't announced it, but I will say that we are working on making another mission and trying to see what can we do next? How can we get uh, in, to the surface of the moon this time in one piece? Uh, we landed in too many pieces, now we need to do it in one piece. And uh, we don't wanna do the same project again. What we wanna do is we wanna create something that would be as inspiring as the first mission or maybe close to that. And we're thinking about how to do that exactly. Do we wanna take uh, more scientific payloads? Do we wanna take uh, some, some technology demonstrators? What it is that we wanna do? And this is a process that is ongoing right now. And you know, I'm, you're welcome to join that discussion about what we're gonna do next. I wanted to do uh, a little more, a longer Q&A because I know some people have uh, some questions and I want to encourage a uh, younger audience as well to ask questions. I know sometimes their kids can be a little shy that their questions are, are uh, you know, what are they going to ask? And I encourage you to do so because it's really fun to have the questions from the kids uh, and because you guys are going uh, gonna to get to stars and other places and I really encourage you to ask some questions. I'll leave this uh, video on and again the QR code uh, on the bottom right there if you want to see a uh, very chic Lego kit go there and vote. And with that, I think we'll take some questions. Thank you. Carrie, do you want to ask a question? I think it's, um, I, I'm thinking it's on to me. She just said, go ahead with oh, me. So um, I will. Um, thank you so much, uh, Yonatan, for being with us today. And uh, there's lots of questions here. <laughs> Um, wow, so people are asking, I guess you, we do know that you crashed into the moon um, and uh, wondering if you got any data, was there any, um, so Holger's here asking, could the crash have been prevented maybe by continuous, more robust data transmission? Was there any data retrieved from, you know, it, it's an exper experiment in itself, even though it's sort of like a probe crashing onto the surface. So um, what, what, what was sent back, if anything? So yeah, we, we did get some uh, data back. I, I do want to uh, point out one thing about a lot of um, a lot of time I've been asked about you know what if you've done something different would the outcome of the mission would be different, and I, I want to point out something that is uh, really not well known about this. But this mission was um, designed not like regular NASA missions. We had very few redundancies. We wanted to make it the, the cost. We wanted to bring the cost down and make it a cheap, affordable mission, uh, which is a big, big part of what this mission was like. And we had a few faults along the way. Um, for example, we had a problem with those star trekkers in the beginning and we had a computer reset problems. And you know, the engineer team that was working on it um, in Israel was very smart and they were able to overcome those problems in real time. It's just the one last problem that we had with, that we couldn't overcome. So I don't, I don't wanna focus too much on that last problem because we resolved so many problems along the way um, that the last one, you know, you, you can't get it right all every time. But the fact that we got so far, I think is, is really exciting. And, you know, we will improve and others would improve and there's some uh, commercial 
uh, lunar missions like uh, the CLIPS program by NASA. And I think that they can take this, this concepts and these designs and move it one step further and to, to get us uh, to the surface of the moon that you know one day we can all go. I think that's, that's really exciting time. With regards to the data itself, yes, we, we did get data. For example, those pictures that, uh, that I shared with you were downloaded while the spacecraft was coming down on the surface of the moon. And that was a big help from uh, NASA. They pointed out uh, some, some antennas from the Deep Space Network onto the spacecraft, and we were able to download some data off of that. Uh, we had also some scientific experiments uh, on board the spacecraft. For example, we had a magnetometer that was supposed to measure the magnetic field of the moon, as you know, uh, the moon doesn't have a global magnetic field like Earth. So, you know, when we go all around the world and we point our compass, it always points towards north. The moon doesn't have a global magnetic field, uh, but it does have some local magnetic fields. These are rocks that cool down, and when they cool down, they kind of get embedded in the magnetic field that was locally there. So we wanted to measure that. Unfortunately, that data um, uh, was not the entire story that we wanted, but we did get some, some uh, stuff back. Your next question um, is from James Burke, actually. Um, what support um, did you get from the government of Israel, if any? Yeah, so um, again, we were part of the Google Lunar X Prize competition and the rules of the competition um, specify that you cannot get more than 10% of um, your funding from the government. So they were actually under that uh, limit. We got most of our funding from philanthropists. So uh, people like Morris Kahn and Edelson uh, family and, and others that were actually really excited about seeing this pro first private mission on the moon and the impact it can do on the younger generation. And they basically gave the money to make that mission a possibility. Okay, another question here we have, um, are you working on a follow-up mission to the moon? So yeah, we are looking into what that follow-up mission is going to look like, and we haven't announced uh, it yet, but it will happen pretty soon. Would you be interested in creating a scouting type organization centered on space sciences in order to inspire the next generation? Um, what does it mean scouting type organization? Or does it say? Creating a scouting type organization. Um, so in the in the United States, we have like the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts right. in the UK. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting point. Um, right now, our efforts are towards um, collaborating with the local schools. So we basically we get the kids excited and we talk to them about space and and it's up to we want to get them into the science classes. There's a lot of uh, we've seen that there's a gap there like. Kids don't are not interested in sciences enough to get into sciences. So our, our current model is more of a collaboration between ourselves and other organizations that are experts in in bringing in taking those kids and teaching them. We just want to get them through the door to sit in those science classes. But it's a it's an interesting uh, concept actually. Yeah. Jonathan Wolf here. It says he's an Israeli youth with engineering education. Once he wants to know what can he do to contribute to Space IL's later ventures. Is Space IL hiring? Go to spaceil.com. There is some. Everything is uh, there. We are uh, accepting some positions, and we are. Uh, there's some ways to volunteer there if you want, and if you want to talk to kids as well. Uh, there's also possibilities in there. Pedro Bowers asks, um, what was the total cost of the project? So uh, the total cost was uh, a little shy of a hundred million dollars uh, and that includes uh, everything. So all the engineering, all the parts and launch and getting to the surface of the moon. We have a question here. Do you foresee to do some science specific for the South Pole of the moon in your next mission maybe? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and there are some uh, some interesting proposals over there. We we haven't announced it, so I cannot share much. Um, but AI, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting proposal. Go ahead, Lucinda. <laughs> okay, I'll do another one. Sure, no problem. Um, 
Okay. All right. So this, I, I haven't heard you speak about the tardigrades yet. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a, a difficult thing to talk about. I was excited about the tardigrades, to be honest with you. Um, and I've been waiting to hear about them. But Calvin asks, which life forms, if any, will you send on your next mission to the moon? So uh, that's an interesting uh, topic. The tardigrades, uh, we did not know they were on board the, the spacecraft. That was, they were like a pirate kind of uh, situation. And um, so unfortunately, I, I don't know uh, much about it and how to tell you about it. They were kind of uh, brought on board uh, without our knowledge. Um, and we didn't intend to get any, any life uh, on the surface of the moon. But for the next mission, you know, we can do maybe a scientific experiment and do this the right way and get... Um, uh, it's a scientific experiment. One of my favorite uh, proposals, again, it's not sure that we're going to do this, uh, is to try to grow a plant on the surface of the moon. I think it's going to be interesting to see if we can get plants um, and have them growing outside of the Earth low orbit and see, having the leaves come out and see Earth in the horizon. I think it's going to be a really cool uh, picture. Uh, it's a really complicated mission, so uh, we, we still uh, haven't decided on if we want to do this or what it is that we want to do, but I'm, I'm rooting for that. Yeah, I've got some interest here from some young, young future engineers who want to be involved in some of the things that you're doing to build Legos and things like that, which is fantastic. You mentioned it being on your available on your website and you just mentioned, uh, you know, pl plants. And I know I live here in the United Kingdom, you know, Tim Peak did a thing with, with seeds. Um, and planting, and of course, China landed on the far side of the moon and grew a plant. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of options uh, to do things like that. So that's really great. What other things can young kids do to get involved with maybe some of your future missions? Um, yeah, so there are, there are a few options. Uh, again, spaceil.com is your best resources here. Uh, there's, um, it can be from anywhere between, you know, come talk to your classes about moon missions and what do you wanna do when you grow up? And I think start a conversation uh, with your teacher and we have some materials to support you some some activities that you can do uh, with your classes and i think that's that's a great uh, way forward and you know follow us on social media and see see the updates and see how we're how we're doing and take part in that way one of the last um couple questions we have here um i'll ask one and then i think lucinda uh, will have time to answer i'm sorry to ask one more um do you have any events um, or public events coming up? And when people are traveling, can they visit your location? So unfortunately, um, visiting is a little difficult to do, um, uh, but we have some virtual events. And again, Facebook page, our Facebook page, Space IL is it's a great uh, resource to look into those. Um, we are having those outreach programs, those broader audience of outreach programs. Um, and these are available again, our Facebook page website are the best uh, place to resource if you want to get involved um, or if you want to uh, contribute uh, as a donation to SpaceIL also SpaceIL.com is the right way to go. Okay so I will ask the last question here. Um, I have someone um, what engineering so Michael Mayer is asking lots of engineering questions. What engineering changes would you make for your next moon lander? I don't know if that's something you can talk about um, but um, maybe you've considered something. Um, that's a great question. I think that one of the things that we um, demonstrated here, um, or a few, a few new technologies that we demonstrated, uh, for example, we, we have 3D printed parts that were uh, installed on board the spacecraft to save us some weight. And that was a really interesting technology because I don't think it has ever been tested before to do a landing uh, with 3D printed parts on the surface of the moon. And I think that uh, that would be an interesting direction to kind of explore more how those new technologies can, can make the spaceship cheaper, smaller. Uh, one key aspect of the mission, and you gotta remember this about space engineering, is that you design the spaceship here on Earth, but the spaceship is gonna operate in outer space. It means that you can't really know exactly how it's gonna operate. And there are some things that are unknowns and some things that you need to um, basically guesstimate or guess and estimate how the spaceship is going to work. And sometimes it's not the case. One of the examples is you can see those, those big spheres over here. These are fuel tanks. And what happens when you have fuel, for example, a liquid in, uh, in, uh, in a cup, and you know the engines are working, you can see that there's a sloshing effect that's going on 
where the where the liquid is sloshing in the fuel tank. And in space, it's a much more complicated problem because there's no gravity, so there's no force that forces the liquid to set down, settle down. And that because most of our spacecraft is, is made of fuel tanks, this sloshing effect can actually be pretty dramatic and slosh the, in, in, and move the spacecraft around and, and can have some controls issues. So this is one of the things we had to, to uh, use simulations and calculations in order to predict how the spaceship is going to work. And the problem with, with sloshing is it's, it's turbulent liquids. So this is actually very hard to simulate and to see how it's, uh, it's going to dump. So I think that we can take the lessons learned from the fuel tanks, for example, and see uh, what kind of mitigations we should have done or we could spare ourselves from doing for the next mission, saying, OK, that was not a big problem as we expected. So we can remove some components and, and use less weight and less power to get to the surface of the moon. Thank you so much, Jonas, and that was just excellent. And I'm just always curious, looking forward to your next mission and uh, hearing about it when you can tell us more. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, guys. OK, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. And it is uh, exciting to be able to introduce you to Sagar Dhaka. He is the president of the Mars Society South Asia chapter. And I have had the pleasure of working with him for the past two years, supporting uh, all the activities that they do in India. And he has been doing some really amazing, great things. Sagar and his team in India put together the Indian Rover Challenge and do an incredible job. They have even managed to continue with remote competitions in the recent months. Well done, Sagar, and welcome. We may have uh, we may have lost Sagar. I'm not sure. Nope, okay. he's on mute. Okay, just unmute oh, yourself, Sagar. Second. There you go. You're good. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, am I audible now? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for introducing me, Lucinda. And uh, yes, the Mass Society of South Asia. Uh, we are just uh, new in this field. Last year on 2nd of September, we came into existence. But before that, uh, in last two years, 2018 and 2019, we were into rover challenges. In fact, to start with, uh, I was part of a rover design team known as Mars Rover Manipal. And it was way back in 2016. At the time, I was in my second year of engineering. And one day, I was just uh, passing by academic block five, and I saw one banner there for uh, recruitment of a uh, rover team. So I gave the written test and then I got a call for an interview and I was selected into the team. Then for five, six months after that, I was working in a task phase, then got into the main team in 2017. And during that time, the team was performing really good. We participated in URC in 2016, 17 and 18. And after that, a new competition was started in India it was uh, IRC Indian Road Challenge 2018. And at the time the competition took place in VIT Velur, which is near Chennai in Southern India. And uh, our team went to the competition and we got the first position in the competition. And it was a one-time competition. Nobody had any plan to continue that competition. Then uh, after that, we decided to take up the initiative and uh, we started the competition in Manipal in next year in 2019. So now coming to IRC Indian Road Challenge. So it's only for its kind of competition which is happening in Asia. The first objective which we had in our mind regarding competition was to provide a platform to the teams which are coming from Asian countries. When we look at the teams uh, from India, Bangladesh, and now in recent past, we have seen teams from Sri Lanka, Singapore, and so it's very difficult for teams to go from India to USA or European countries. In fact, the cost uh, of traveling, the cost of shipment of a rover from Asian countries to USA is three times the cost they spend on making a rover. So that was our primary objective. So the competition has three different stages. The first stage rulebook. We generally release the rulebook in the month of July and August. And then we come to system review round. And in this round, we have a, a five minute video and 12 page report. And after this, we select a certain number of teams for the finals. And then those teams compete in the finals in four 
different field tasks. In fact, uh, in the beginning, in 2018 and 2019, we took a lot of help from Kevin Sloan, uh, the director of URC, and Daryl Robertson. And that was a great help. Uh, and because of that exposure, we decided to continue the competition in the uh, coming years. So this was on 26 July 2018. This was uh, the rulebook launch for uh, Indian Rover Challenge 2019, which happened in Manipal. So when I was doing this, uh, I was the event manager for the competition. So the one thing which I realized was, see, it's very difficult to manage these kinds of events. There are a number of technical things which can go wrong. And yes, I was reading rule books before this, but reading a rule book and compiling a rule book is altogether a different thing. But uh, I had a great team and with the support of the team, we were able to put up a great rule book. It was liked by the teams. And uh, slowly, slowly, we kept on progressing. Now in the competitions, we have four main tasks. The first one is ERDT, extreme retrieval and delivery task. Second one, equipment servicing, autonomous task and science task. So we have divided in three days. The first day is ERDT and the second day we have equipment servicing autonomous together. And the last day we keep it for science. Now, when we talk about these four tasks, we always want to have a good site, a site where we can design things with complete liberty and can have enough space so teams can perform freely. So it was a big challenge. As you all are aware, India is very, very crowded and it's very difficult to find an area to simulate Mars. So in the beginning, we went with this plan, the plan which you can see here. You can even see a lot of trees uh, there, but uh, after five, six months, these trees were cut down and then we had a really good site uh, for IRC 2019. In fact, this was the meeting. It was in August 2018 when we decided this, uh, when we finalized this plan. And you can see all the uh, administrative people from the Institute of Manipal. So the extreme retrieval and delivery task. So this task is happening on the first day and it's the, one of the most challenging task uh, physically for the rover. You can see here the rover, the winning rover of IRC 2019 is traversing Rocky Garden. So this rocky garden, we have a special kind of rocks. Here you can see it more clearly. So that road has to traverse over this. And then we have ditches. At the time, we had 0.8 meter ditch. And uh, here you can see it was after the competition. The teams were just traverse, uh, traversing these uh, hills. And there was an astronaut here uh, during the time of competition. So teams had to race to that astronaut. And it looks really easy now because uh, somebody's controlling from the remote. But during the time of competition, the person is sitting inside the base station. He is not able to see the uh, outside area. And the only thing he has is the camera feed. And because of that, he has to, uh, from that, he has to control the entire rover. And that's get very, very difficult. And second task, equipment servicing task here, uh, it is designed to help astronauts uh, uh, on future mass missions. We have different kinds of uh, knobs, uh, switches, which the rover has to work on. So it is designed in such a way to check the capability of the robotic arm of the rover. In fact, in last edition in uh, IRC 2020, we even had uh, typing for the rover. In fact, only two teams were able to do it. It was very, very difficult. And we even plan to continue with the same in uh, next edition also. And this was autonomous task. It was in IRC 2020. Here, it is divided into two parts. The first part, the team can use, can have teleoperations and uh, they can use scouting. And the second part, the last stage, the third stage, they have to be completely autonomous and the rover has to race to these tennis balls. And in fact, uh, for the very first time, we even use arrows for the direction of uh, uh, rovers. And then we have the one of the most important types of science tasks in fact, uh, it is the most interesting one. Here the team has to take samples from the dedicated side, and then they have to do analysis and uh, certain experiments to come to know the habitability or whether extinct life is, was there and whether extinct life is there on the surface. And after this round, we have the one final presentation dedicated for science. So this part is, this task is divided into two parts. Here you can see the drill. In fact, uh, on Mars, there are different kinds of rocks which are very difficult to drill. And some teams, for example, this team from Poland was, so they were using an electrical drill. 
which was very very effective so the coming to irc 2019 uh, it happened from january 9 to 12 uh, in mit manipal and we got registrations from 32 teams we selected 16 teams for the finals and 10 teams participated and we had around 300 participants then and this was a winning team team in vishak from iit madras chennai in fact it was their first uh, uh, irc appearance now this was a photo i call it my favorite photo and we worked the entire team worked for around 7 to 8 months to reach to this level and uh, it was on 12th of january uh, last year now coming to this year's edition the irc 2020 happened from january 17 to 20 in vit chennai and this was event was a huge success the platform which we created in 2019 was capitalized in a very good way we got 35 registrations we invited 20 teams for the finals and 16 teams turned up and out of those 16 teams the best part was there were four teams which were competing for the first time so we are very happy to see that uh, we were able to get new teams to the competition in fact the process is continuing and this year even during lockdown we have seen four to five new teams coming up for the future editions of irc we have got a lot of queries for the next edition so many teams which were not uh, active earlier and uh, this was the winning team ajsp systems from poland in irc 2020 and yes uh, this is me and uh, harshit actually we started this thing uh, by sending a mail to lucinda <laughs> it was in march uh, last year we thought let's do this thing and this was the during the meet and greet session uh, in uh, irc 2020 you can see all the rows and the best thing which i like about this is the every row is different from each other when we compare our competitions uh, with other competitions in student communities like we have society of automotive engineers we have baha competitions we have student formula competitions but there all those cars all those drones they look quite similar but here some rovers are having four wheels some are having six wheels and it's entirely different no two teams have similar kind of rovers so that's really good to see the final photo for i2020 and this was the photo with the winning teams uh, in center you can see Uh, team Vosso from Poland, AJSP Systems, and then Team Rudra from SRM Chennai, and the organizing committee. And there's one more thing which is different about IRC is that it is a competition by the students for the students. Every year we try to host the IRC in a college which has a rover team, and the people who were making the rovers, those people come into organizing committee and then they organize this competition. so that's a really different part when we compared with the other competitions so this year after the coming of uh, corona virus all the teams got affected and uh, it was a very challenging time so there was a competition which was in my mind from last two years in fact we even planned to do something similar in uh, irc 2019 also as a subset of irc 2019 but at the time we did not have that kind of experience and now we had that experience and we even try to take the chance so that competition is known as in an road design challenge so it started in july this year and it's the first entirely virtual competition of road challenge series and the response which we got from the team was overwhelming we got 30 teams from seven countries across three continents so this competition was quite different from the other road competitions there were certain things which which were we were observing from last 3 to 4 years in uh, road challenges for example a lot of teams as it is a competition they come to win the challenge so in that they bypass a lot of things so there are a lot of things on the rover which can be designed to better suit martian conditions so here in in a road design challenge the teams were asked to design a rover which can function on mars so they had to dig deep and they had to again refer the books research papers to design the rovers here you can see some of the designs this left one is from team rudra of srm here you can see the teams are using solar panels in uh, irc they go with the uh, batteries lipo batteries and uh, lithium ion batteries 
so here team had to do everything from scratch the radiation level mass is different the temperature because the irc is happening in earth conditions now when we talk about mass it's entirely different and our plan is to have the problem statement of irdc coming to irc after 3 4 years so we see a convergence point where we slowly slowly with time gradually increase the difficulty level of irc so that teams can also adapt themselves uh, in that time and this you can see the left one is from a team from italy team dyna and uh, this right rover is from a team darbar from bangladesh so now as it was a design challenge we also had uh, innovation awards for example team from usa michigan they had a really good power system and uh, for manipulator drive systems and science system we gave different award so that uh, in the coming editions we can expect teams to improve their designs in uh, sub domains also because when we look ab about irc the teams take it as a one competition they see it as a four task and the entire competition but when it's come to indian road design challenge there is no particular task the road has to be such that uh, it is adaptable on mars so with that kind of approach they give their designs and uh, for this we have uh, engineering design review uh, which was a 26 uh, page report which team submitted which included all the cad models calculations from the teams and uh, on the basis of that uh, they just took a call about the designs of the teams and then we shortlisted the teams uh, for the first three and for the innovation awards now we know that uh, urc is happening from 2007 onwards it's quite a time the 13 years when i look back uh, and observe this uh, at a time i was i think in class 5th or 6th and i did not have any idea about rovers but uh, again when we think from the perspective of a student we see that uh, our community is not that built in fact there is no as such a, a term known as rover community but in the recent past we have seen lot of new teams coming there are around 100 active teams in the world now uh, which are building rovers every year if not every year alternative year they are coming to the competitions so last month in september from 12 to 14 we host martcon mass rover teams conference and uh, again it was kind of test we had plans for 2021 but then we thought like let's do it this itself and it was attended by 30 teams from seven countries and during the conference the we decided to form one a consortium and this is known as concert consortium of mass over teams so right now what's happening is there's hardly any transfer of knowledge and uh, ideas from one team to another so in the long term we plan to have a very gelled up community where teams can uh, have communication among them so that it will be beneficial for everybody and it will definitely help the new teams which are coming which find it very difficult to build the first rover now there is one more event which we are organizing at the end of this month it is known as international mass hackathon when we look at our other competition irc irdc all those competitions are designed for the rover teams the first reason was that i myself come from from a rover team and the entire board of mass society south asia all our four members of rover teams so the first plan was to establish competitions for them and to have a platform for them where they can perform now to improve the skills to improve the level to improve the knowledge we wanted to have a hackathon so here it's not just about rovers this time we have in the problem statement kept uh, things like agriculture on mars and space administration and management so we wanted to have an overall approach towards mars and uh, space i think it will be a really really good uh, initiative in the long term in fact uh, the registration is still going on and uh, i was surprised to see a lot of registration from the teams which we don't know and even the teams which don't have a rover they are also participating in it so the plan is to have it in a two day 48 hours uh, a competition and after the 48 hours we will have uh, the evaluation of the solutions and approaches provided by the team so if any one of you is interested please register on our website 
साउथ एशिया डॉट मास सोसायटी डॉट ओ आर जी नाउ एज वी सेट मास सोसायटी साउथ एशिया वी हैव वेरी क्लोज इंटैक्ट रिलेशनशिप विद टीम्स फ्रॉम श्रीलंका एंड बांग्लादेश एंड इवन सिंगापुर नाउ एंड सो देर इज वन डिफरेंट केस विद श्रीलंका दे हैव रोवर टीम विच केम लास्ट ईयर बट द डिफरेंस इज द टीम इज वन बट दे आर इलेवन कॉलेजेस इन्वॉल्व इन मेकिंग वन रोवर because they did not have resources and one college was not able to come with a rover team so they combined 11 colleges and those students from 11 colleges are together part of a single team and then they are making a rover in fact they registered for irc uh, last year they were unable to come and they participated in irdc and uh, they achieved 14th rank that was really really good for the first time team now in November this year, we are hosting again a hackathon in Sri Lanka. It will be in Colombo, and it will be in collaboration with Set Sri Lanka. So this is going to be a different one for uh, people who are in Sri Lanka. And in fact, the act in space it is supported by European Space Agency and French Space Agency. It was supposed to take place in February and uh, April, but because of uh, Corona, it got delayed, and now it's taking place in November. now i have some announcements uh, to make the first one is uh, that we are getting two new chapters of mass society in india in january the first one is in srm institute of technology the first rover team from india is from this institute srm and the team is known as team rudra uh, they came third in irc this year and they have been participating in uh, Rover challenges since last five six years. The team was established in 2012. Now they are coming up with a new chapter there, and the host institute of uh, host institute of IRC 2020 VIT. They are also starting a chapter soon. Now this is uh, something which is, we are working on right now, and is it is at the top of our priority list, as we have seen that. Uh, in the recent past uh, there have been lot of talk about mass helicopters we have seen that uh, even bob balram was speaking before me uh, and this is a new field where students uh, would like to definitely would like to uh, participate so we are going to host one uh, competition which is known as uh, this second yes so we are planning to host this competition in february 2021 we have all started the work and we have got some people from uh, society of automotive engineers aero design competitions working with us so we plan to host it virtually next year and after that from 2022 onwards we plan to make it uh, an online uh, a field event along with irc and now because of pandemic we have seen that teams are facing a lot of difficulties and particularly in south asia it's very difficult for our team to get uh, uh, sponsorship and funds so we have decided that we will create a rover team support fund from this year onwards and we will be supporting one or two teams uh, every year and uh, it will be based on a lot of uh, certain guidelines which we will release in our next uh, mass rover teams conference and uh, we will definitely looking forward to support more and more teams once we get mature and uh, we even plan to come up with new competitions to support the teams right now we are in the building phase and we are trying to do as many good things as possible but as i said it's a testing phase once we get settled i think by next year uh, we will be able to host uh, more competitions Yes, thank you. You can follow us on Instagram, Mass Society dot South Asia, and we are also there on Facebook and LinkedIn as Mass Society South Asia. For any queries, questions, suggestions, you can contact us any time at contact at South Asia dot Mass Society dot org. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is so. Uh, exciting um, to see everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Fain. I'll be asking your first question here. Um, what support are you getting from tech companies? 
Oh, so far, we haven't approached any company, and frankly, we are getting no support as of now. But our plan is to approach some companies from 2021 onwards. In fact, when I was working as a member of a robot team, we were getting a lot of sponsorship from uh, good companies like Mauser uh, and uh, there are a lot of others. And even the companies which are into CNC, laser cutting, they were supporting robot teams. So now next year, we plan to have some sponsor for our events, which can support the teams and uh, which can come uh, take down their course to a lower level so that they can spend more time so on more time on their role rather than trying to get sponsorship for their project okay the second part to that question is what do you want to get support on um for example what help um are you hoping to get in the future um specifically see we have two things in our mind the first thing is uh, to have sponsors which can support the team. That's the first thing which we want to do. And then in long term, we want to have a dedicated site where we can have our competition in the Rover Challenge. Right now, the biggest challenge for us is that every year we have to develop a new site in a different institute. And it's get very, very difficult to organize in a different place. And so we want to have one dedicated site. And India has a lot of good places for this kind of mass uh, simulators. Uh, Ran of Kutch in Western India, that's a very good place. And then in Himachal, we have Laulan Spiti Valley. And then in uh, we have Ladakh area. So all those places are very suitable. And I think even the India's Indian government and even Indian Space Research Organization, they are looking at those places. So if they develop something, we will definitely getting help from that. And uh, the second point is we plan to get one big support from the companies which are, I would say, the tech giants in India. For example, they are uh, Mahindra, Maruti, and Reliance. They are supporting some very big competitions. So far, we haven't been able to get uh, those companies into robot field. One reason is we haven't approached those big companies yet. And the second reason is uh, it's not in their field. Because when it comes to car, all the automotive companies, they are there. When it comes to even other competition, even they're having competition for these uh, tractors, the farming tractors. So they're also, we had a lot of sponsors. But now that I think time has changed. In the past three, four years, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, private companies related to space coming in India. In fact, uh, one of them was finalist in uh, uh, Google Challenge also. So these are two things. The first, the sponsors for the teams so that they can reduce the cost, the amount they're spending on the rover. And the second one is to have a permanent partner in hosting our competitions because right now it's very, very difficult for us to manage this every year. Very inspiring. Sagar, I'm gonna ask you to actually share your last slide again. That way people know that they can, how to contact you because we do have some questions here about well, some people are saying yes. awesome work, they're, you know, and uh, others wanting to still get in contact with you. So go ahead and share that last screen so that people know. Um, and I, as executive director of the Mars Society and someone who's worked on the last five years to grow the chapters around the world uh, for the Mars Society, uh, along with our chapter director, Nora Hovey, you know, Sagar has done a fantastic job. Um, he, Sagar, can you just say which countries you represent in South Asia? Yeah, I am from India and right now I'm living in New Delhi and uh, like I would like to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart the entire Mass Society USA and like uh, when I got introduced to URC in 2016 at the time I did not imagine that I would be doing this thing after four years. In fact, I was a member of management domain. I was working completely non-technically but when I left the college, I realized that uh, this is a good thing and we should continue it uh, so that the, the teams and the students who are involved in this, they can get advantage. But yes, all of this is possible because of uh, support from uh, you, Lucinda, James. And like, I think I'm the person who disturbs him most in the world. Whenever I get time, I just message him and he's also very, very supportive. And I think in the coming years, with uh, your support, we will be able to do even the bigger events and we'll continue to do this. 
I think you've got lots of really great support there with the universities that you've told me that and, and us today um, that are willing to work with you. And that's obviously because of such a great job that you've done working with them. Um, so you are definitely a part of the Mars Society family. There's a question here about that, um, whether you're registered in India and are you part of Mars Society USA? You absolutely are, are one of our chapters in the world as we do have many and we're growing. Um, but uh, what do you, I, I just want to thank you so much for all the remote work that you've been doing, especially through the pandemic and keeping it going and just uh, the great, the great uh, you know, effort you have made for yourself in India and your team. Um, but I wanted you to actually say which, so Mars Society South Asia, which countries in South Asia are those? See, in South Asia, we have eight countries. The first is India. And then in Indian Ocean, we have Maldives and Sri Lanka. And then we have two Himalayan countries, uh, Bhutan, and Nepal. And then we have Pakistan and Afghanistan. So these are the countries which we have uh, uh, in South Asia. And uh, right now, there's one more thing which I would like to highlight. A lot of queries from a lot of people from a lot of countries regarding uh, joining Mars Society South Asia. In fact, we wanted that thing to happen long back ago, but because of our competition, we did not get time. Now in November, we are planning to have a recruitment. The people whether they are from technical domain or they are from non-technical domain, that doesn't matter. If they are interested to join us, they can join as a volunteer. In fact, the, my entire team and me, we are working as a volunteer here. And we would definitely like to have support from people from other countries. In fact, uh, uh, two days back, uh, we were getting uh, one query from Vietnam. And uh, that was really, really encouraging. And uh, as you mentioned about the universities, yes, in fact, the events which happened in last two, three years, it was because of the support from the universities. And they have been very, very proactive when it comes to student competition. And that is the reason these kind of events are happening. And along with universities support, the moment we get the support from the industry, I think it would be a really, really good uh, platform for the teams and it would be sustainable in the long term. Well, well done, Sagar. Thank you so much for sharing all of this work and hard work with us. I'm going to move on now to Dr. Robert Zubrin, Thanks, who is going to, um, who is going to um, help us uh, say goodbye. Uh, hello. Um, so uh, we're coming to the close of the conference now, <clears throat> and uh, this has been uh, an epic event. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank everyone who made it possible. Um, the, all the volunteers, um, all the speakers, um, the conference committee, which uh, included, uh, among other notable people, Mike Stoltz, the director of Mars Society Publicity, Susan Martin, um, the uh, Nicole Willett, uh, Lucinda, uh, and uh, most especially uh, uh, Carrie Fay and Jim Burke. Jim Burke is the genius who made this vast participatory uh, conference possible. Uh, and, and because it is a participatory conference, I wanna thank all of you, the attendees. We have now reached 10,000 people have registered for this conference and over 100,000 people have viewed one session or another. This is not only 10 times larger than the largest Mars Society conference in history, Okay, uh, it is, uh, if we include all the viewers that have watched it from around the world, it is 10 times larger than any space conference in history. This has been an epic event. And uh, I, I think this is going to have uh, impact on how scientific conferences are done uh, from now on. Because, you know, going to a conference um, has typically cost at least $1,000. Um, the $500 for the airplane ticket, several hundred dollars for hotel rooms, $100, $200, $300 for registration, and, and sometimes twice those amounts. Um, and uh, that, of course, has restricted participation. Now we have democratized this. We have had a conference which anyone in the world who wanted to attend could attend anywhere. And uh, this is, is, is just uh, huge. Um, and we're going to have to think uh, seriously. Uh, I, I don't know whether we're going to have a teleconvention next year. Unfortunately, Unfortunately it, it, looks it looks like, like the, the COVID 
uh, is uh, likely to continue into next year. And so it is highly probable that we will have another teleconvention. But you know, this year, this uh, teleconvention idea, simply we thought of it because we couldn't do our regular convention and it turned out to be uh, a, tr a triumph. We said that the, the slogan of this conference is rising together and we have risen together. So I want to move on from there to talk about the challenges that lie ahead. Um, and this has come up in the course of this conference. And uh, it, I must say it was prominent in my discussion with Elon Musk when I visited him in Boca Chica earlier this year, something that has him greatly concerned and which he would like our help on. And it also came up in the discussion with uh, Administrator Bridenstown yesterday. And this is this need to loosen the bonds of this thing that calls itself the Planetary Protection Program, but is really a bureaucracy and ignorance protection program. Um, this thing that uses a clause in the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 to argue that humans cannot land on other worlds because we will spread contamination to them. Now, it should be noted that in 1967, no one thought that that would be how this treaty would be interpreted. In fact, we landed people on the moon two years after we signed the treaty. So that interpretation is false. But uh, a group of people who have installed themselves in various bureaucracies uh, want to use this to expand their power um, and, and are crippling the space program. Uh, the Curiosity rover was prevented from going to places where we saw what looked like water seeps to look at them by the planetary protection people. Um, at this conference, at this conference, Chris McKay, a great scientist, by the way, who wants to find life on Mars, who has devoted his life to, uh, to trying to find life on Mars, who wants to send a life detection experiment to Mars. Now, there has been no life detection experiment sent to Mars since 1976 because of the planetary protection people, okay? So he is forced to justify his life detection experiment, which is a scientific investigation to search for life on Mars with the argument that it's going to be used to certify that there is no life on Mars. And so we can assure ourselves that we can send people to Mars because it is uninteresting. Now, of course, the real reason to send a life detection on Mars is not to not find life on Mars, but to find life on Mars, okay? And if we find life on Mars, that is exactly where we want to send people. People are the best scientists there. So the people are by far, I mean, maybe elsewhere in the universe, there are better scientists, but in our solar system, people are the best scientists and people are on Earth, which is why we know more about the Earth than any other planet. Um, and that's why we need people on Mars. So we, we don't need to explore Mars to try to find a place where people can go on Mars where they can't do science. We want to explore Mars so we can send people there to do the best possible science. Okay, and, and but the planetary protection people have so distorted and inverted uh, the priorities here that uh, they are a tremendous impediment. I heard another speaker say, well, the sample coming back from Mars, we either shouldn't do it or we should send it to the space station when the whole point of doing a Mars sample return is to bring it to Earth so it can be examined in thousands of university laboratories with a multitude of instruments that are simply not available on the space station or on Mars rovers or anything of the kind. So here's the thing, look, there are two reasons why people are interested in Mars. And uh, some like me, I'm interested in both. Some are just interested in one or the other or 70% in one or 30% in the other. The two reasons are science, in particular, the search for life. And the other is opening the new frontiers. So science and frontierism. And okay, the frontierists are quick to recognize that the planetary protection bureaucracy is uh, fatal to their aspirations. So the planetary protectionists uh, 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 attempt to then cloak themselves in, in, in the cloak of science, that they're protecting science, when in fact they're harming it greatly. Um, you know, they say that, for example, uh, uh, that if humans go to Mars, it will be impossible to know if we find life on Mars, whether we brought it or whether it was there before us. Okay, this is nonsensical. We know 
there was life on earth before us, okay? Why? Because there are fossils about that show the existence of life on earth before us. And only creationists believe that the fossils we have found on earth uh, do not prove that there was life on earth before people. Well, similarly, if we go to Mars, if we find life that is fundamentally different than terrestrial life, it obviously was there before us. That is, if it doesn't use RNA or DNA or the same amino acids as all terrestrial life does. If we find life that does use RNA and DNA, but as a forms unfamiliar to us on Earth, then we also know that it, we didn't bring it. If we find life on Mars that is identical to Earth life, to well-known species of microorganisms, well then, the test will be, are there fossils or other biomarkers? If it was there in the past, those markers will be there. If we find identical life along with fossils, we'll know it was there before us. If we find identical life, but no fossils, we'll know we brought it, okay? But the kind of investigations we need to do on Mars, that science needs to do on Mars to determine the nature of Martian life, because this is the key thing, to know if we find life on Mars, whether it is the same or different, whether there are separate genesises, whether life as we know it on Earth is what life is, or just one example drawn from a vastly greater tapestry possibilities. These kinds of investigations not only involve fossil hunting, which itself is an extremely complex task involving hiking long distances through unimproved terrain, doing heavy work like digging and pickaxe work and delicate work like carefully splitting open shales to find the fossils pasted between the pages of the rocks. Okay, that's way beyond the ability of, of uh, uh, robotic rovers to say nothing of what's needed to find extant life, uh, which involves drilling to find liquid water either at the bottom of glaciers or deep underground, and then bringing up those water samples and culturing them and subjecting them to all sorts of examinations uh, is light years now the, uh, uh, beyond the ability of robotic rovers. So we cannot let the planetary protectionists close the frontier in the name of science. They are as much enemies of science as they are enemies of, 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 of the human frontier. And, you know, Jim Bridenstine actually uh, did a significant amount to loosen those constraints, but it's possible we could have a, a new mass administrator who uh, be susceptible to arguments from, from, from this bureaucracy to restore its power, or even strengthen it beyond what it already has been. So this is a fight we're gonna to have to wage. Beyond that, and, 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 and I must say, once again, that Elon specifically asked us to take this on because if these people are allowed to have their way, he can develop a starship and he won't be able to fly it to Mars, okay? So yes, there's a way, but it also takes will. He's gonna provide the way, we have to provide the will and we have to help move aside the obstacles. Furthermore, okay, the flux in space policy that is likely to occur in the near future provides an opportunity, okay? Especially if Starship flies even to the stratosphere, let alone to orbit this year or next, okay? That will be a shot heard around the world. That will make it clear that humans to Mars is within reach if we decide to do it. Now there's a number of systems that need to be developed beyond the starship to make humans to Mars reality. There's all sorts of systems. Space nuclear reactors are needed on the surface of Mars to provide reliable power. Okay, that would be something very hard for SpaceX to develop because it involves the use of controlled materials. It needs government support, either government involvement or at least government cooperation and permission. Um, Mars spacesuits, Mars rovers, and other vehicles, all sorts of things, bioregenerative life support systems, you name it. We, we need to use the example of SpaceX to say to the body politic, look, this is within our reach if we meet Musk halfway. Let's do that, okay? You know, um, one idea for Mars missions is Musk's idea, which is to use the Starship itself as a lander. But in my view, NASA itself should start developing a heavy lander. They've got SLS, mission useful for SLS to send a heavy lander on 
trans-Mars trajectories and land massive payloads on Mars. Expeditions of 30 rovers could go to Mars, fan out with all kinds of instruments, do all kinds of comprehensive science, but build a gas station on Mars, okay? That's a mission uh, that, that, that could be done. Um, because once again, NASA is working on ISRU technology, SpaceX is functioning on the flight system, okay? We need to meet them halfway and we can. So we have our, our, our work cut out for us. You know, um, there's a vision to be realized. It's now closer than ever. Um, you know, there's three spacecraft on the way to Mars as we speak. We've heard about the mission and we're going to start flying on Mars with the Ingenuity helicopter and, um, you know, um, the word ingenuity, of course, is related to the word engineer and to the word genesis. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of flying on Mars. Um, it's the beginning of doing all kinds of new things on Mars. So this is our time. Uh, we're clearly a, a movement right now. We're a global movement. And we need to do what we can. We need to spread the message. We need to recruit more Elon Musks to the cause, um, more entrepreneurs and supporters in the political system and supporters in the media, wherever they are. We've got to recruit them. We've got to bring them to our vision. And so um, finally, uh, you know, we heard uh, last night uh, some songs, some sung by Bob McNally, some by Oscar Castellino. Music has the capability to inspire, to spread a message, to reach the heart. And so in closing, I'd like to bring Bob McNally back to close the conference with a couple of songs. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. And uh, my extreme congratulations to the entire Mars Society for an absolutely incredible human experience that this convention has been. It is clearly, uh, you know, groundbreaking. And as uh, Robert said, setting a pattern for uh, conferences in the future and, uh, you know, setting the groundwork for what will eventually be interplanetary conferences. And um, I just want to say one little word, which is, I think for me, one of the real high points of the, of the convention was um, Alan Stern's uh, talk last night at the banquet with the um, his, uh, you know, deep description of uh, putting the New Horizons project together in only four years with uh, 2,500 people dedicated working, you know, seven days a week, uh, you know, 50, 60 hours a day, a, a week um, to make that happen. And it's just an incredible example to me of the power of distributed ownership. And, and that's exactly what the Mars Society represents. And um, this song, On to Mars, is about all the challenges that humans have faced every single time they've gone through a barrier, every single time they've uh, attempted to go where they couldn't go before. And um, I invite you all to sing along. The words to the chorus are uh, on the screen here. And um, with no further ado... One hundred thousand years ago, we traveled north to dark and cold from Africa across the plains, struggling on that long walk. We learned to make and improvise with skins and stones. We stayed alive. Our genes were calling down the line, calling to us to move on. We're moving on to Mars. We're headed on to Mars. We're going on to Mars, on to Mars. We're moving on to Mars. We're seeking life on Mars. We're bringing life to Mars, on to Mars. A balsa raft, a skin canoe, a wooden boat out in a storm. Across the oceans we have roamed, immigrants on that long ride. Another ocean there to cross, Mars is ready there for us. Mars is waiting down a line, ready for us to move on. 
We're going on to Mars. We're headed on to Mars. We're going on to Mars. On to Mars. We're moving on to Mars. We're seeking life on Mars. We're bringing life to Mars. On to Mars. We've done this many times before, found the skill, made the will to build the vessels sleek and strong to carry us on that next ride. But could it be that we've become too timid to attempt our dreams, our courage calling down a line, calling to us to move on? We're moving on to Mars. We're headed on to Mars. We're going on to Mars. On to Mars. We're moving on to Mars. We're seeking life on Mars. We're bringing life to Mars. On to Mars. Now it's time for us to go. We're leaving on that midnight ship in smoke and rumble, flame and roar. Strap in for that high ride. Our courage brings us here once more to march with those who've gone before. Our children watching down a line, watching as we move on. Our courage leads us here to find a Martian home for humankind. Our children's children down the line thanking us for moving on. Let's go. We're moving on to Mars. We're headed on to Mars. We're going on to Mars. On to Mars. We're moving on to Mars. We're seeking life on Mars. We're bringing life to Mars. On to Mars. On to Mars. On to Mars. Join me. On to Mars. On to Mars. We're moving on to Mars. We're seeking life on Mars. We're bringing life to Mars. We're going on to Mars. On to Mars. Bravo. We are the Mars Society over.